don't, I don't want an intro today. So, we don't need one. <laughs> What's up, guys? Hello. Hello. Hello, peoples of the internet. What is going on? What's up, Bamp? What's up, Kev Rob? Lurker extraordinaire. We are early. Figured we'd uh, goof around. Goof around with some stuffs. Stuffs and things and such. Got lots to... Lots to do. Lots to do. Start off and do some, do some chipping. As more people filter in, we'll talk more about different types of weathering stuffs that I do. Always seems to get people pumped. I think I forgot something on this, right? There was something that I forgot. Oh, the wheels. The front wheels. I forgot to do the chipping on. Sponge. Actually, cushion piece of foam out of uh, pluck foam in go bag. That's what this is. Cut it into weird shapes so you don't get a very symmetrical patterning out of it. And bingo, chipped wheel. Almost like we know what we're doing. Don't ever blame me for knowing what the hell I'm doing. Wheels typically get a lot of chipping if they're just painted. So never be afraid to, as the paint dries on the sponge or runs out to go in and just kind of force the issue it'll give you a lot of little bitty on scale chips and such death hour what is happening 38 freaking months are you kidding me are you kidding me <laughs> boneyard what's going on viking teabagger bamp says help i started playing league again there is no help for you that's not how this works Right. So Therapy Thursday is not able to rescue you, rescue you from the clutches of League of Legends. That's that's not how this works. Right. All right. So, again, I'm just I'm only using this. Right. See, I've got paint on. You can see where the paint has been drying and reused and all that on this point. Like I, I carved this like a pencil point, except it's irregular shaped. Right. So I can kind of just kind of give it small flicks. I can rotate it around. Obviously, if I'm being, doing a, a area where they're all close together, I don't want to hold it in the same direction. I don't want to hold it like this and think, 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 think. It'll still give you variation because it's a sponge, spongy material, and it will collapse on itself. But it'll, it won't give you the same amount of variance that you really want, right? So you just kind of want to turn it. And keep using it even as you start running out of paint. I typically... Wipe it once on a paper towel or something just so I'm not coming over with big globs of paint instantaneously because the texture will get uh, very minimal. Right? As you have more and more paint on the sponge. So you got to be a little careful. But you can take it and do like little swiping motions like I've done there on the door. All sorts of stuff. I can squeeze it all tight. Get in the tight areas. But I forgot to do the wheels. So there you go. Wheels. Right. Once it's got very little paint on it at all, that's how you do this. Right? You get those areas where there aren't any very big chips. It's just stun baked and small chips happening. Right? And then, of course, when you do a lot of paint, you can get stuff like that, where I rubbed like all the paint off the lower edge of the door there and the back end of the fender and all that. So you just be more aggressive with it. And do all sorts of crazy stuff. The foot step there where you would have a lot of trafficking of boots and stuff. 
doing paint as they because generally when you place your foot on something like this you go for the corner all right so you just have the corner kind of chipped away from getting up into the truck easy stuff think about it right it makes sense more wear and tear on the front grill area as it goes through bushes and hedges and whatever the heck else is going on right back here as it throws rocks up into the fender Right. The edge of the window on the bottom part of the sill where people are grabbing it or hanging their arms out or whatever, right? Less so on the top, just because there's not really anything that gets beat up there. And, of course, wheels. Super simple, but all this is done with sponge, right? Um, you've seen me use a lot of chipping mediums and things like that. They're great. Um, it's just, you know, uh, how to put it? For me personally, if I want to do a lot of chipping, it's either because I want to show you guys using chipping fluid or it's because I'm doing something like whitewashing, something where I'm doing like a whole big effect on a model and chipping stuff back for a, a much more um, um, kind of overall effect than just individual chipping. The sponge works great for just chipping, especially at this scale for like bolt action and stuff. Um, as the models get smaller, the the sponge method works less and less because it makes too big of a pattern as you get real small so i wouldn't use the sponge method necessarily on like flames of war tanks right stuff like this i might but you can see how instantaneously even the little chips on the door of that truck become really big and so the scale gets you very very beat up very quickly here um so here I might go through and either cut a sponge really, really small or use like a, just a paintbrush and just kind of dab and stipple scratching on here because then I can control how fine the chipping winds up being as opposed to having it be very large and out of scale. All you guys are like, we never hang out with Fuse anymore. <laughs> yeah, Viking Teabagger was around when we were just doing video games, I think. Got a child on the way, Viking. Nice. Next week, holy hell. Oh, my gosh. Parenthood. Parenthood. Congratulations. Doka, what's happening? Welcome back. Hope everybody had a wonderful uh, middle of your week now that we're here at Thursday. And uh, I'm going to play around. We're going to do some more weathering. The title says it is Therapy Thursday. We're going to be doing uh, all sorts of stuff. I've got a, a pre-painted up rhino here with some uh, open side. It's, it's only, I've only done this side. I did this with uh, one of the Basement Collective guys, Kevin or Irvin. I can't remember. Um, but I did this with them a long time ago as a as a one-on-one -on -one tutorial where I showed airbrushing vehicles and how to create some weathering patterns with the airbrush. So very similar to what we're doing. And we've had a lot of people come in and say, hey, do you ever paint sci-fi stuff? Because this World War II stuff's boring. So here, I got this. I brought it from the house. Bingo, we have sci-fi stuff. But the techniques are the same, even though the colors are totally different, right? And I also highlight a lot more and to bring a lot more of that edge pop contrast in when I'm doing like Space Marine stuff. On a World War II figure, I would never do this edge highlighting as bright as what we've done here, right? But this is all uh, airbrush, except for the black part in here. I think I did real quick just with black because I didn't do it back here. So that's just the black primer, and we just did some gray on it real quick as a, as a follow-up thing. So uh, everything here that we've done has been with the airbrush, and it looks like I probably took a little bit of thin-down paint to do, like, grit and grime in between, like, around the door and stuff like that. Not a full over wash, but just like a pin wash in between. It looks like I did something there because that's, that's darker than it would have been, I think, with just the airbrush. And it has the paint marks on it. It's been a long time since I did this. So it might be null oil or something. I don't know. All right. But we'll use this side panel to do some weathering. Uh, a lot of people have been asking about oils. So I got some oil paints. I told you I promised you I'd go pick up some oils. So I went and for $8 at Hobby Lobby, I picked up 12 colors of oils. Just the master's touch uh, oil in a tube. So uh, I'll show you how with very cheapo, we've done this before with their acrylics, it's a lot of fun, uh, but with just very cheapo oil colors from your local hobby store, you can do some really cool effects. A lot of people asking about oils. Uh, we've talked a lot about why 
where, when, why, and how oils are really good. Oils can do really, really cool effects. Acrylics can do the same effects. Acrylics are a little bit harder and more um, tedious to apply and get to look correct than oils. Oils are a lot, of, a lot more, put it on the model, slop it around, woo, it looks awesome. Um, there's only a few, you know, key components that you have to understand about oils in order to get it to look really good. Um, but then oils take forever to dry. They don't ever really truly fully cure. So you got to be careful. You have to like varnish your model a ton of times in order to have it playable on the table. Like if I were going to push this model around, you know, and pew pew and, uh, and, uh, have fun with it, uh, playing bolt action, I would need to make sure that my varnish coat was bar none spectacular or just with one greasy, sweaty finger playing a game could grab the turret, twist the turret to take it off and smudge all of my oil streaking and stuff on there. Uh, even with like just one coat of varnish, you can reactivate the oils uh, because technically oils never fully cure. They can always be reinvigorated with a little bit more oil. Your skin has oil in it, uh, and so you can start moving pigment around. They're not like acrylics where when they cure, it's a sheet of plastic, and it's not going to come back alive. You can scrape it off. There are materials you can use that will melt it and bring it off and strip it and all that, but you're not going to move acrylic around after it's dry. Hence the reason we don't paint like the outside of our house with oil paints, um, right, because they just don't, uh, they don't fully cure as well as acrylics and enamels and uh, late, general latex stop paints so all right so we will go through and uh, but we'll show you some of that and show you what you can do with it uh and i've also got some other surprises that i can show you tell you t don't tell you you can't oil paint your house i want you to go by windsor newton and paint your house with windsor newton paints personally that'd be pretty cool <laughs> you don't know what you're doing but fearlessness has worked for painting maybe it fits in life with children i feel like parenting is just have being fearless right because that doesn't come with an instruction manual you can go buy a Parenting for Dummies book, and it'll help, probably. But you never know. I mean, you just never know. You can say, all kids are the same. They might be. Over the scope of their lives, right, you might say, oh, they all do the same things. The problem is when they do them and how they do them, I feel like. You never expect what your children are going to do to you, Viking. Just remember that all of us here in chat are there with you in spirit as you go through this process. Right, as you get no sleep and you do the parenting thing. Just remember, we're right there with you. We're right there with you. <laughs> yeah, paint your house with a triple zero brush. Doka says he's not with you. Doka backed out. Doka couldn't handle the stress. He's gone. Right, he's gone. He's enjoying sleep. He's not there with you. Well, Doka, I didn't say I was going to lose sleep over it. I just said I'm with him there in spirit. In spirit. I'm going to, as soon as Viking's baby is born, I'm going to do like the, the baby, you know, reveal, gender reveal overlay on my Facebook profile picture, right? So he knows I'm supporting him. Kind of like people did the flag of France, right? Transparent over their faces on Facebook. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something for Viking Teabagger. I'm going to put a transparent overlay over my profile picture on Facebook because it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you. <laughs> Your spirits are in your cup. You're already drinking a diaper. Yeah, we put a diaper on it, like a transparent diaper over the front of all of our pictures. That'd be hilarious, actually, by the way. Somebody needs to make that happen. All right, so uh, we were sponging and putting on some uh, chipping and stuff. I think, I think I'm good. I'm not worried about the bottom of the vehicles. I don't care. I don't care. Truck. Uh, I chipped the Puma. I, I did a little bit less chipping on this than I did on the truck. I'm thinking I probably want to add a little bit more heavy chipping on here. So let's do that real quick before we get too far into just weathering. Do a little bit more. Not necessarily bigger chips. I mean, although some of them will be like that, right? But just more uh, area. I can imagine guys climbing up on this bad boy. I just want to make sure we get at least some spots. I don't want to do it all over, but we'll just pick like a spot or two and amp it up a bit.
Notice how I don't, I, I obviously don't have a whole lot of paint on the uh, foam because I'm not getting huge amounts. I'm just getting little bitty spots. And that's what makes this really work well. If you go too full bore on it, right? If I just dip it in the paint and then go straight to the model. So I'm, I'm using it like a dry brush. I'm basically off to the side, kind of. I need to cut this is what I need to do. I'm gonna recut. It's time to resharpen our sponge. Bingo, looks good. It was starting, it gets so much dried paint in it after a while that all of the area in between the, uh, the cells of the foam get filled, right? And so then your texturing starts to be the same. It just becomes a big blob as opposed to any sort of cool, spongy looking texture. Go right in the middle of the back here and just kind of notice how I'm rotating the foam around as I'm doing it. That'll ensure that my pattern on the back there is random. And even though it's crossing over the, uh, right, even though it's crossing over all of the, the camo there, you can see that it's, it's putting a nice chip texture on there. That works pretty good. I'm using black brown. For those of you that are just showing up. And some black brown chipping with just a piece of pluck foam out of the go bag. Because <laughs> I have a lot of that. So. Makes some sense, right? You can see on some of these areas, I already took some transparent brown and started dippling it in over the chipping to give it that kind of rusty effect. I didn't do a whole lot of it, but I was showing somebody at the uh, shop yesterday where I would be going next with this whole thing. Take this off real quick. Use the sponge and just kind of rub it in a downward motion at the corners. So I can start building up just kind of a dirty paint stripped edge there where the turret has these hard angles to it. Do that all the way around. Pretty good, actually. Yeah, mucho better. And again, you can go to your heart's content. Just realize that, you know, the more outlandish you get with the amount of chipping that you do, right, the less functional your vehicle starts to appear to the human brain. Right, there'll be a time where it's like, uh, really, dude? Like, isn't that a little overboard? Now, what that level is, that's completely up to you. Just be aware that you can get very quickly to a point where it seems like you've uh, you've done too much. thing over here being all clean that's not that's not part of the rules squeeze this thing kind of tight so jam it up in there that uh, looks pretty good That looks pretty good. We can go with that.
when I'm down to the end, I know I don't have a lot of paint left. Again, I can kind of just streak it along. Take this off of here. Get kind of some cool, oily, soot kind of streaks going. So there's barely any paint left. So it acts almost like a like a light dry brush, but it, it's done with a very, very weird patterned edge because of the sponge. So you don't just get a line, you get some crazy busted up shading and such. Can do pretty well. There we go. That's a pretty good. Uh, it just, I felt like I needed some more in certain areas. I didn't want them to be too busted up, but that looks pretty good. Pretty nice. I'm assuming your brains work correctly. Do they not? <laughs> Black brown is definitely a workhorse color. It is one of the best colors that uh, has ever existed. I love ours. It, uh, you know, it doesn't give you the feel of brown. It looks like chipped paint, especially when we're doing this desert yellow or basically any color. You know, because it's not, if you go in with black, sometimes you get too much contrast. So if you do your chipping with a pure black, just be aware that you'll need to go over that with something that gives it that dulled down feeling, right? Black tends to be too crisp, too much contrast, too clean at that point. And clean's the wrong word, but it, it kind of is, right? Uh, the black brown gives you the ability to make it feel like there's already dirt been rubbed in all these wounds, right? T. Schmidt, what is going on? What is happening? Big cheers. Going to drink some water. That's what I do. Delka says, I haven't painted in a couple of weeks. You got to get back to it. What are you doing, dude? How in the world does one take two weeks off from painting? I don't even understand. Trust me, there's times where I'm like, can I take a week off? <laughs> could I take some time off? I just want to do nothing. Pyromancer, what's going on? Yeah, I figured we'd focus in on a little bit. We've been doing a lot of World War II stuff for Bolt Action lately, and I've been blowing through doing some weathering and such. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing with the, uh, the truck, the good old uh, Moltier here, and, uh, and the Puma. It's not the Puma. And we've also got a uh, Space Marine Rhino pow, that we can work on and do some cool stuff. I've already cheated and kind of done a little bit. You'll see a little bit of like rusty, drippy nonsense on the back end there. Right, if I can get that right there. You see it? See that? So I'm going to show you some really cool tricks you can use, uh, some really cool products you might not be thinking of that will do some really, really cool weathering things. We're going to talk a little bit about oils. We had a specific question earlier in the week about using oils because a lot of streamers right now, a lot of... Uh, um, what we call them, uh, content creators, influencers in the hobby world right now are, are learning about oils. And so you have a lot of people out there using oils maybe for the first time in the hobby, um, and they get excited about it. Oils do some really, really cool things. Uh, so we're gonna, we can talk and answer some of the questions there on, on what and when and where and how oils really make sense and what to be careful with and all of that. So we'll, uh, we'll discuss that, uh, that sneaky little tool that's in our tool belt there. So. You haven't been having a lot of free time? You've been lazy playing video games? Well, you know, priorities. I mean, if you feel like you just have to go to work, then I guess. <laughs> yeah, Pyromancer. Weathering is one of those things that it's, uh, it really makes the model in a lot of cases. It, it can also ruin a model if you go overboard, right? Like, when is enough enough is, is really one of the fundamental things to think about with weathering because it's an effect that looks super, super cool every time you do it. Well, I mean, let's assume you know what you're doing, right? And that you don't just glom paint on with the, the sponge, you know, or something, you don't mess it up, but you know, like, so as soon as I go through and I hit 
the side of the turret with the sponge the first time and I get this kind of chipping effect going, all of a sudden I'm like, oh wow, that's bitching. And so now the fear is, okay, what if I do too much? Like I could just keep going and eventually the whole thing just looks like there's hardly any paint left on it at all. That can tell a really cool story. It might fit in like a grimdark 40K sense. You might go through and do something like that on here and blow it all out, um, you know, but you got to balance all that, right? Because our, our own brain, you know, you get that stimulation of awesome, I'm doing awesome things and this looks great. Um, and so you might want to just keep going, but you have to kind of temper that with what makes sense to the story you're trying to tell with your model, right? Because not every tank on the face of the planet, you know, is a big hulking steaming pile of doo-doo as far as like paint chipping off of it and stuff. So being able to manage what, when, why, how, all that kind of stuff is big. So we're going to go through again. Again, I've just kind of cut a piece of uh, foam, pluck foam out of our go bag into this kind of sharpened pencil feel here, right? And I'm just going to use the tip, get a little bit of black brown out, kind of dab it on my hand real quick to make sure I don't, don't have too much paint on here. And then we'll just kind of come over here and start It's a very soft sponge from the pluck foam, which is nice because it will deform and not leave just a big, huge, honking pile of uh, color anywhere in particular. The first thing I want to do is kind of hit edges. Rhino's got a lot of sharp edges all over it, so we can kind of... Top edge. Again, notice how I'm rotating the foam around as I go so that none of my texture looks the same. All right, so just kind of hit it, rotate it. Don't rotate it 360 degrees because that doesn't make a difference. Kind of tilt it back and forth, side to side. Not every edge has to be, you know, beaten to crap. You know, you might be like, why would this edge under here have much chipping on it at all? I typically like to hit all my edges, but I might not place any big chips in certain areas and just let them be a little worn, right? Which is fine. Go ahead and right over the top of my effect that I've been doing back here. Do the chipping kind of secondarily. I should have done the chipping before I did that effect, but I was making sure that this model was going to take white spirits okay before I brought it on stream. I didn't know if I had to varnish it. I haven't varnished anything here. So one thing that we're going to be talking about a lot is uh, as we get into like oils and things is the necessity for multi-step varnishing. So going in in the middle of a project and um, popping some varnish on a model so that you can do the next layer of effects uh, in, in a lot of cases, you're going to want to uh, make sure I'm going to have heavier chipping towards the back end of this thing where the tracks are throwing crap up against the back edge there, maybe. But a lot of times we're mixing paint types, right? So like enamels, oils, you might be doing an enamel wash or an oil wash like we're going to show you or something like that. And then you're going to do, uh, you know, a, a acrylic mixed in. Been rolling across there. And you can't just always paint those types of paint right over the top of one another very easily. So you have to be thinking about when and why and how I'm going to jump in and throw in a coat of varnish to make sure that I protect the under layer from reactivating or having problems with a, you know, a different color that I'm putting on or a different type of paint or effect that I'm trying to do. So we'll talk a lot about that, but I have not done that here, right? I haven't done any varnishing here. So we run the risk during some of this uh, of, you know, always wanting to test. Now this model has been painted for over a year like this. Like I said, it was in a, a private class that I did that I was showing how to airbrush vehicles. And so we just did the side of this Rhino. Kind of backfill and get a bunch of chipping on the front there. And you can see how every time we hit the model with the foam, 
we get a really cool thing happening. And that's why I say you got to be careful. You got to temper this because you can you can hopefully kind of register in your brain pan how easy it would be to go out of control right now, right? Like every time I poke another little dot on here, I like this model even more, right? And you can be like, oh yeah, that's great. And you can like it the whole time that you're adding too much. And then when you get done with the model and you set it on the table, you're like, oh my God, that's too much. Okay. That's pretty good. Not too overboard, but we got a lot of good chipping on there. A lot of good action. Maybe a couple more big ones someplace. Oh, that's pretty small. So let's, uh, I'm not going to wipe off a whole lot of the, the sponge now, and I'm just going to kind of come back in and be a little bit more aggressive here. See if we want to get like a couple of big chunky roonies up there. Maybe a couple down in here. Get the bottom area along the track guard here. Now I've pushed my finger up a lot closer and I'm using my finger to actually make sure that more paint leaves the sponge and gets onto the model. I'll just come back and lightly hammer along that edge. Sorry, I probably zoomed in a little close. The camera seems to be defocusing as I do this herky-jerky application of stuff here. Bingo. I like it. We all like it. Done. Well, I don't know if we all like it. I'm going to assume that you guys like it. It looks pretty good. Super simple. Right? And again, that's just a piece of pluck foam. Uh, pull it out of a bag. Uh, I'm using the pluck foam out of our go bag, uh, but you could grab a stick of pluck foam from anywhere. I prefer this very dense kind of uh, cell foam from the pluck foam like this because, you know, as we zoom in, you'll see how much texture you can get out of it, right? You see how small each little individual peak on there can get. So you're gonna get a lot more unique patterns of texture out of this than taking a sponge, right? Like a normal sponge from the grocery store or something isn't going to have this dense of a, of a you know, a, a weave. It's not really a weave, but you get my drift, right? Like a, a normal dish sponge is gonna have a lot bigger holes in it. Which can also be cool, but it brings the scale up a lot. So it would need a bigger model, Night Titans and stuff maybe. This will allow me to go down to pretty fine scale stuff and to deliver, you know, that kind of texture. Which at the scale of this truck, this looks completely realistic. There's nothing too overboard here, right? Now I went pretty aggressive with like the, the skirt of the lower end of the door, having all the paint stripped off of it so that I could do some cool rust stuff there. Uh, but it's still all in scale. And what I mean by that, if you're not familiar, is that nothing, none of these little dots are to the size that they're like a human fist, which wouldn't make sense, right? So they're scratches from, you know, leaves and twigs and stuff smacking against the, the truck, running into stuff, just general people, you know, leaning up against it, leaning equipment up against it. You want to keep everything feeling in scale, like all of this could be more realistic, right? As opposed to just big clumps of blackness rolling around everywhere, right? Same thing here. Other techniques like what, Pyromancer? Yeah, we're going to talk about all sorts of, we're going to do some oil streaking. Uh, we're going to do some rust. Um, we can do whatever. The thing we do around here is that there's no plan, right? So when I come on and I paint, ask me. You got something you want to see? Boom. Especially on Thursdays, but pretty much every day. Uh, especially, I mean, and on other days, it's a little tougher. Like if I'm painting a truck to say, hey, how would I do something that doesn't have anything to do with a truck? Sometimes I'm not set up to just grab some new model. But on Thursdays, no rules. You want to see something? I'll do my best to show it to you here. Uh, with regard to weathering like this, I've got these three tanks, but we got plenty of models. I can show you all sorts of stuff. If you want to see non-metallic metal, whatever, ask away. Greek Nakos, is that picking my nose? Is that emote picking my nose? On salt or hairspray? Um, so they're both good techniques. Salt typically is too big of a scale. Uh, on like 35th scale military models, like tanks and such, it works really well. 
Um, if you get fine ground like table salt instead of the larger crystalline salt, sometimes you can you can make it work, but that's really, really fine and sometimes doesn't work as well. So the, the biggest issue there is scale. Um, I typically prefer the products made for the hobby now. Uh, the hairspray treatment, uh, the hairspray works really good as a medium for chipping. Um, the salt, if you're not familiar with what uh, Pyromancer is talking about, is that in order to do chipping, you can, you can do the sponge technique like I've done here, and you get, you get chipping like this. Um, you can do hairspray, which means that you paint, and we've done a lot, and there's, there's uh, videos up on our YouTube channel of parts of streams and stuff where we've done chipping away paint. That's what this guy has been done with, right? So all the chipping on this, you know, giant Russian robot pie um, has been done by stripping away the red paint to reveal the color underneath. So this model was painted completely silver first, and I shaded it and highlighted the silver first. Then I went over it and uh, put a coat of, in this case, the Warn Effects from AK Interactive, all right, which is a less messy version of hairspray. Okay, uh, it's just an acrylic water-based product. What's that, babe? I left it on just in case you wanted to walk in and say hi. I'm saying hi and bye. Hi, bye. Have fun. Have fun storming the castle. All right. So I use the AK Warn Effects. I'm a big fan of like Warn Effects, the heavy chipping fluid from AK Interactive in particular. I don't like the Vallejo chipping medium much. Um, the Vallejo chipping medium tends to be a little bit more sticky and sometimes doesn't allow the paint to dry. It's weird. I don't know if it's batch to batch or what, but I've had problems with it, whereas the AK stuff I've never had an issue with. Um, but you can put this through the airbrush very quickly and airbrush it into individual spots. But so basically you paint a model an entire color. So this was painted all silver. Then once the silver dried, uh, dried to the touch, I went ahead and sprayed through the airbrush the Warn Effects. I did a good solid coat of the Warn Effects fluid over it. And then once that got to the point where it wasn't tacky to my touch on the model anymore, I sprayed the model with reds, right? Bill Neary, what is going on? 18 freaking months, my friend. What is happening? Right? So... Then we went back over it with the red and we painted and we, you know, shaded the red. So we've got dark and, you know, mid-tones and, and bright reds on here real quick. Did that with the airbrush too. Uh, and then once that paint was on there and dry, we go back with like a wet Q-tip. Uh, I typically use these, right, which are the makeup applicators, real small, the pink or purple, they call them makeup applicators, the micro applicators. Um, and then you just take this and you get a little bit of water on it and you start scraping at the red and it will cause the red to come off because the what the hairspray or chipping medium the worn effects mediums do is they keep the uh, the upper layer of paint floating on this material that will reactivate when it gets wet so as the water draws through the acrylic paint because that's how acrylic paint works if you even though it looks dry if it's not fully cured and you tap it with a wet thing that water is going to permeate through that layer of paint hit the hairspray or the chipping medium, and now that re-wets that area and lets the paint move. So now you're able to strip that paint off, right? So everywhere where you see silver on here is not done with the sponge, like I just showed you. It's done by actually removing paint, right? So real chips. So the cool thing with this and the salt method is just that you would go through and put the hairspray or the chipping medium on here and then sprinkle salt on and, um, it allows you to be a little bit more specific with where you want your chipping because you sprinkle a little salt on the shoulder, sprinkle a little bit on the chest, sprinkle a little bit over here, or you might just dip the whole model in salt, who cares? Um, but typically you wanna just drop salt where you want to do your chipping, then you paint over the top of it, and now your paint has this ugly texture in the spots where the salt is, right? As soon as the paint dries, go back and pull the salt pieces off, chip the salt pieces off, and it shows the color underneath. Uh, just an old hobby trick uh, from way back before there were mechanisms like this. Um, and the hairspray had a tendency to not want to allow you to go back through and reactivate the paint. So the salt chipping away is what made all that really work. Um, nowadays with the chipping mediums, I prefer this because then I don't have to use the salt. I don't have to worry about the scale. The longer I let the model sit before chipping at it, the less paint will remove. And so I can go from everything from just really fine scratches to big chunks, right? So we just did this on stream. This is one of the ones that we did on stream and showed how to do that. And you can remove big, huge chunks. You can just kind of scrape along an edge or you can do really fine kind of not, you know, uh, scratches that don't even go all the way through the paint. Let me see if I've done any of that on here. Looks like we kind of just chipped everything down to the silver for the dramatic effect on this guy. He's a little bit more cartoony. Right. 
But yeah, uh, again, a very effective way to do chipping. It's just, this is a bunch of steps further. Does it deliver something better? In my opinion, it can. If you were to go through and paint this model rusty colors, let's say, deep browns, uh, you know, uh, burnt oranges, yellow ochres to give real rust color, made the whole thing just painted like a big rusty thing. Then put the, the hairspray or the chipping medium over it, use salt or not, and then spray it red, let's say. Then when we chip back, we get those pre-highlighted rusty areas, and that can be really cool. Uh, but I find that with the sponge, you know, I can get just as neat of an effect, right, that produces the same exact thing. It's just that it doesn't allow me as easily to do things like silver underneath. Because if I use the sponge to add a bright color of chipping, like if I wanted it to be, uh, I've painted over something that's, that's chrome and the paint's chipping back, to go in and use the sponge and do silver doesn't look very good. It doesn't look as good as the chipping, in my opinion. Um, but it's doable. It just takes a little bit more work. So six of one, half dozen of the other. Uh, I feel like uh, for a lot of people starting out, this is a little bit more daunting to do the chipping because you have to paint, let it dry, put on a medium coat or the, you know, the uh, hairspray coat on there, and then paint the model again fully and then start chipping it back. You can get some really good realistic effects. You can actually make the paint tear and give you a dimension so that it looks like a real chip, like a bullet hit it or something. I'm trying to think, where do we have other models where we've done this? We've done this quite a bit on stream to show people. I'm trying to remember if I have anything else sitting right here where we were able to show the paint tearing away and giving a good texture underneath it. I feel like it was a model that I sold. It was that uh, Admech. 30k model yeah so i don't have it here i don't think i have maybe the little chibi tank actually we did some chipping on this guy all right yeah all right so if i can get the camera to cooperate for us if you look in right in here all right let's see if we can Pull it back just a hair and get it to focus really nice. If you look right in here, see how there's a dimension there? There's a texture. You can see that that's a real bump, right? There's a little bit of a ripple in the paint, right? There's a little ripple in the paint right there, right? That's a physical texture caused by scraping the paint away. So there's actually a dimension there. It's not a painted dimension. It's actually a texture on the thing that'll cast its own shadow, right? So you can get the paint to actually push and tear so that it looks even more realistic, right? Because that's what would happen. At, you know, as, as paint on metal gets an opening in it, right, where we've scraped off the paint, and then water and gunk builds up, the paint will start to bubble almost on the bottom side where fluid seeps underneath, starts breaking the primer seal or whatever, and now you can get an air bubble or a bubble of liquid where if you went up and poked it, the paint would be like, you know, you know rubbery. And if you poke a hole in it, water would drip out, and then it would shrivel all up and reseal. So if you've ever come in contact with that, you can create those types of effects with the chipping solution, right? Because you're actually tearing the paint. So the more aggressive you are, or if you get in with a very fine like uh, airbrush needle, you can push the paint and give it those edges that look realistic. So it just depends on what you're going for. Uh, that you can't obviously create if you're doing the sponge technique, right? The sponge technique, none of that has a dimension because it's all just paint, right? So you'd have to highlight this and give the illusion of it having texture, but you're not going to create texture like you do by uh, the actual chipping technique. A good question from Pyromancer there. All right, so all of this is pretty much set. Uh, we'll use this Rhino to show off some, uh, some techniques for doing what would come next. Uh, generally what I do next is after having the chipping on there, using a black brown, mix black and brown together if you got it, or use our black brown. Uh, uh, everything we're using here is Pro Acryl paints. Silent, what's going on? Yeah, what's going on? Thank you for that follow. <laughs> and Puma. Wait a minute. 
Wait a minute. Myrtle, what's going on? Tell you a story. Grandpa, I thought we was friends. Uh, Boneyard says, how about a little tutorial about chipping high and highlighting to give a sense of, of false depth? Okay, yeah, definitely. C. Cough. I'm going to go with, is the 357? No, it's not. I thought maybe you were trying to go for coffee. What's going on, C. Cough? Thank you for that follow. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, and yeah, we can do that on this guy, as a matter of fact. As a matter, let's put a couple of bigger chips on there, because with the small ones... It's not as prevalent if you're going to go in and highlight. But since this is a Space Marine sci-fi model, we can go a little bit more cartoony with it. Normally, I don't highlight chips. Like when I'm doing World War II, I should say not normally. But when I'm doing like, you know, going for realism, I don't highlight the chips really. Uh, maybe a few to give it that, that flair of kind of working a, a bigger chunked out area here on the door, just kind of rotating the foam around. And give us a nice big paint chunk there that I can actually do some highlighting on. We'll put another one up front. We'll kind of broaden this whole area up here up a little bit. Again, just kind of rotating it, not hitting the, the same spot from the same angle. But I can get a big chip that has a very, you know, randomized texture to it. If I just go bang, 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 and build up a lot of, uh, you know, color in one area to give it the feeling of a big chip, uh, then I won't get that kind of sporadicness to it. And I can wind up with something that looks like I just painted a circle or, a, you know, a, a booger on the side. This will help spread that out and give us the sense that the, the chipping is a little bit more realistic. But yes, good point. Now, the first thing that I would do, though, is I would go in and I would start adding other color. Like we said, I'm, I wanted to use black-brown here. That's my typical go-to color for chipping on anything where I'm not doing like a substrate of metal that's, uh, you know, something particular. Like we said, like chrome or, you know, silver. Like on our, our giant Russian robot pie. For those of you that are new here, that's just a joke. Um, the, uh, the silver underneath is meant to show that it's like an invulnerable metal. They just happen to put paint on it so he looks good. Right. You can imagine that as it strips off, it's like adamantium or something. Who knows? Um, so it wouldn't rust. It's not going to be, you know, dirty and as grimy underneath. It's like space age uh, was the goal here. Uh, hence the reason we did it in silver on something like this on the Space Marine Rhino. Maybe we do want it rusty. Right. Maybe that's more the thing. Definitely on the World War Two stuff like the Puma. Right. We'll definitely have more of that rusty color. And you can see how I've already started going through and stippling in a little bit of our brown transparent acrylic over the top of those areas where the chips are just to discolor the paint around it where now that you have chips, you have a different texture on the surface of the metal. That texture will catch particles of dirt and oil and rain and everything else. So now the area won't just be clean. Water won't just run down and, and stop or go all the way to the floor. Uh, it'll catch in all these pockets. And so it will pull all of the grit and grime and soot with it. And you'll get a buildup of color in these spots, which includes around the outside too. Because the texture isn't just inside where the paint is gone, it's on the outer edge of that too. Now the question uh, posed in chat was to do a little bit of highlighting of the paint to give it a false sense of depth. You, for sci-fi models like this, great, go for it. On stuff like this, I typically don't do it because by putting that highlight, like say on the bottom edge of a, of a, a chip, um, it makes it look like the paint has peeled away. If you do that on all of them, it just starts looking funky to me, right? Because that's not how it would work. Chips, if anything, once the paint has chipped and then wear and tear, kind of, you know, polishes that down, right? Now, the older it gets, the longer it sits still, you can go up and actually take your fingernail and like pull the paint off, right? But on something that's in active use, it's moving, it's got rain, it's being cleaned, it's got people walking on it, those chips are going to flatten themselves out more than not because there's still stuff rubbing on it. It's not sitting out in the sun baking and the paint just keeps peeling away. If you're trying to do that, then you highlight the edges of the chip, gives it that feeling that the paint's peeling away, right? It also looks very good on sci-fi stuff because we just like a little bit more bright contrast, right? I've highlighted the, the upper edges of stuff a little bit brighter on this uh, Rhino than I would on any World War II vehicle. And I've gone from darker to you know brighter uh, values on my colors just for the same reason, 
right? Uh, if I were painting like an American uh, or Russian tank, I would not use these greens, right? I wouldn't go up to this bright yellow green uh, from the dark camo green. I would, I would be a lot more desaturated. Uh, so as you're painting something like a salamander's rhino, you know, you can go a lot more uh, uh, into the bright spectrum and value and you can start highlighting those chips. But before we do that, we wanna give some color to those chips. Right? We want to give that little rusty tone to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of our transparent brown. Right? So this is our transparent brown. I think I've got a little bit of black mixed in with this one. I can't guarantee that. I don't remember where my bottle of the mixture is. I'm going to say this is it. Because I think I took my other bottle of transparent brown and started throwing a bunch of uh, uh, transparent black into it. But I can't, uh, I can't say for sure. Because I don't see the rest of those paints. We're going to go with yes. All right, so we're just going to put a little bit of this out on the palette. I'll turn the palette cam on. We can see what I'm doing with the palette because a lot of what we do when we are doing effects is going to rely on how thin we go with our paints uh, because we're not always, especially with acrylics, we're, we're still in the range of acrylics right now, guys. Until we move to oils, oils give you a little bit more flexibility. You can paint with them right out of the tube. Uh, and do some really cool stuff with them and then thin them out while they're on the model. Uh, with acrylics, you can't do that, right? They set up too quick. So let me get a stippling brush. Bam. So remember this little way on that? Maybe a little, nah, I think that'll work pretty good. That might be a little too stiff. Hang on. We might have to cut up a new brush. Let me see. Yeah, that one's going to be too stiff. Oh, this one. Yeah, this guy. Okay. So here we created a stippling brush. We just took an old, what is this? This is, uh, this is an old number four. This is the super old first gen utility brushes. Before we called them artillery brushes, uh, they were called utility brushes. So it's an old utility number four round. And once it's re reached the end of its life, I typically take a lot of round brushes and I'll trim them down. So now we've got this crazy flat top style brush that is great for stippling, right? It's great for applying paint like this. I'm not gonna brush stroke with this much, Right, but I'm gonna apply paint like this. And so if I use a really thin paint, I can get some really cool texture out of it. So let's take some of this brown black and let me get a brush that can actually thin that out. Problem with a short stippling brush, that doesn't do that very well. Right, so here is, right, there's our, our brown and black transparent mix. I'm just gonna grab a full brush load of water and just dump it right in there on the side like I do. Pull. A, you notice what I did, I took a wet brush and just tapped the edge of the paint. And you can see all that pigment running down into my water now. So basically what I've done is I've just gotten dirty water, right? And so this is going to be a good color of brown. I can pull a little bit more pigment in there as I need. Bingo. Life is good. That's the kind of thickness that I'm working with right now. Take my stippling brush, make sure it soaks up a lot of that paint. And we'll just come over here, right? And uh, I'm just going to take it and very lightly kind of start the same way we did with the sponge. I'm just going to... Start tapping color in the general area. You're not, you, you don't have to do it everywhere. You're just getting in the general area of where your chips are and mostly in like where the big ones are, right? So around in here, you can see how it discolors. It gives me that very faint kind of rusty glow, we'll call it. I don't know if that's the term. It is now. But again, it's in a randomized pattern. It's not going to be like painting circles on the model. Go in and just kind of lightly Tap down the edges of these corners where we've got some chipping. Because we're using that transparent paint of ours that's so great, it's going to look awesome on the model. It's going to let all that green show through. It's not going to be near as vibrant as the chips themselves. Obviously, Tune the size of your stippling brush to the scale. I probably wouldn't use the same one on our bolt action models. It's a little big for this rhino. And what we're gonna try to do here, it's great. And I'm gonna get that kind of spotted color that fits with the texture of the tank. And like you're seeing, I'm not overdoing it. At least I'm trying not to overdo it. The more you add, the more crazy this whole thing becomes. Again, just kind of practice a little bit of uh, temperance here. Right, big go. 
now I've discolored my chipping area, right? Just kind of all around it, giving it some extra texture, right? It looks like now we've started adding this kind of splotchy look around here. Could be, you know, where liquid catches as it runs down, grit and grime and smoke and soot, whatever it is, right? And that starts building up all over our rough spots. Gives them again a, another layer of depth, but also brings in some color to them. Okay, so now you can do that. You could add other colors if you wanted to. We could go in with a little bit of yellow on top of that. Because this has got a yellowy, yellowy green on it, I probably wouldn't do a lot of yellow. For normal rust streaking, I typically use like a yellow ochre. In this case, I'd use a little bit of our yellow transparent mixed in with this brown black that I've got. And we could go ahead and stipple that. So let's try that. Uh, where is Voist yellow? Over here. Chuck Wiffen Different, what's going on? You got the paint set going and love it. Nice! I've been able to get better effects with it than any paint I've ever used. Fantastic, man. That was our goal. Yep, exactly. Our paint will do whatever you want it to do, and it will grow with you as your skills grow. So I'm glad you're digging it. That was our goal when we set out. You know, I've said for years I wouldn't make paint unless we could make better paint. And I feel like we knocked it out of the park, not to just toot our own horns, but... I feel like we did it. We came out with a better paint. It works better in all situations, you know, and allows you to do kind of whatever you want. As you learn a new skill, you can say, yes, our paint will do that. All right, so again, I'm gonna just come over here. I'm gonna grab a little bit of this yellow, right? A little bit of this brown. Make kind of an in-between color. I don't want that bright yellow on here. It's a little too much. Right, but I'll do this. I'll get kind of a good muddy brown. Again, bring out a bunch of water into that. My other brush here. A lot of water in that. Bingo. Stippling brush. I haven't really cleaned the stippling brush. It still has the other color in it. That's fine. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I didn't get too much, which I did. I got a lot of liquid in it. Now, it's, it, I forgot that because I hadn't cleaned it and I put it in the water. So now I have cleaned it. I'm a lying liar who lies. Looking over here and I'm like, wait a minute. That's a lot of material. All right. Now we're good. Take it and I can just kind of get in and around those same areas, maybe just in the ones that are bigger. You can see how you could use whatever colors you want. Your finger eraser to kind of smudge it if you need. Right. Because we use yellow green, like I said, you're not going to get a whole lot out of anything yellow on here because it is transparent. You could use greens, oranges, reds. Uh, we're going to do all that with a different brush. So we are going to take a small brush here. Ta -da. Just a number two round. Track, what's going on? The Great White North Panhandle? Wait, what? <laughs> Chuck, take it easy, man. Thank you for the shout out. Thanks for taking the time to come in here and tell us you love the paints. That's awesome. Glad you are liking them. All right, so let's grab a little bit of burnt orange, right? Uh, Let's do a little bit of burnt red first. All right. Take a little bit of burnt red. Since we're working with this green sci-fi tank here, play around with some colors. With rusts, obviously, uh, burnt red, burnt orange, yellow ochre tend to be the colors that I will go for. Right? Just if I if I had in my tool belt, you know, a standard trio of colors, it would be burnt red, burnt orange and yellow ochre. So we're gonna put them out here. All right, there's some burnt orange and some yellow ochre. It's been snowing all day in Texas. Oh, oh ah, what? <laughs> been using so much yellow ochre with these tanks and my 
desert yellow or German yellow kind of scheme, right? All right, so I'm gonna take a little bit of water on my brush. I don't want this to be super duper thin, but I want it to be thin enough that I can still play around with it, right? So kind of like this, right? Notice how it's gonna cover okay, but still give me a good transparency, right? That's what we're going for. And on these, what I wanna do is getting tight, just kind of speckle in some color. Again, here I'm really looking for those spots where I've got larger chunks of paint missing. So this, not going to use near as much paint when you get to this stage. And I'm just kind of poking paint, little stippled dots in the bigger chips. Doesn't have to be at the bottom of the chip, top of the chip, doesn't care. Who cares? You're just turning the, uh, the bare metal underneath, shifting its color away from that black brown a little bit into more rusty tones. But the reason we thin the paint down is because obviously you don't want like a super bright red here. Or maybe you do. If you're doing regular rust, I would say you probably don't. But you may be doing your own thing. You can adjust this to fit your needs in the story that you're trying to tell. If you want this to be you know, weirdly red rust, maybe it's filled with all sorts of Martian dirt. You want more red to show through? Fine. Get in there. Right. You can see our red now. A little bit of red poking through on these areas. Real subtle. If I can keep it in like that. It might blur out on us a little bit, gang. Because I'm working real close, it might defocus as I use the brush, but this will help you see as I'm applying the colors. So again, we'll go to orange. All right. Here's my orange. Again, going to let the bottom colors show through. See how that works. That's about the thinness that I want. Don't have to stay perfectly in the lines. These colors will bleed out onto the surrounding surfaces. But in this case, I am trying to stay like inside the bigger chips. But if the brush kind of squibs on you, no big deal. And like we said before, if you were doing the chipping technique, right, with hairspray or salts, any of that, you could have done this all instead of spending time doing it, you know, very micro, like I am, stippling, you know, all these little bitty bits of color around. You could have painted the whole tank with these colors of rust, the browns, the burnt reds, the oranges, and so on and so forth. And then use the chipping technique to chip the green away, and it would reveal all of these colors underneath naturally. Now, the problem with that is that you are never guaranteed. If you do the salt version, then you can kind of guarantee where you're going to be chipping paint away and what, you know, of the orange and browns you're going to see. But if you don't do that, then in a lot of cases, you know, you might chip away and you might get a chip that only sees dark brown, right? And so it won't be as... Uh, intense as the work you actually put into the variation in colors in your oranges and such. So, I typically prefer this. Now we've got some rusty colors happening in there. And by stippling rather than trying to paint little lines, you get more texture. Right? 
You can just place dots as close or far apart as you want to get more color. Okay, super simple. Knock yourself out. You've kind of already controlled yourself with the amount of chipping you put on, right? If you went nuts and you got tons of big chipping and you start doing this, now you can see how you start compounding the effect of having overdone it. You wind up with so much rust on the vehicle, it doesn't look like you'd ever get it started. It's never going to see combat. Unless, of course, you're doing something for Nurgle or, you know, something insane chaos like that. The demo marine, right? We're, this is gonna, we're just going to do a demo chapter, Myrtle. I feel like you're not wrong, right? Well, eventually, uh, Myrtle's talking about like our demo marine, our poor demo marine, where we do you know all sorts of weird showing people how to paint <laughs> on this little guy. I found three more of these, by the way. Uh, so I have more of these dudes uh, that aren't painted. So that's, that might be a thing. The demo marine might have friends. But this, yeah, this would be like the demo chapter. Because they're all in various states of disrepair. Although I feel like that hits too close to home. I've seen too many armies like this on the table. Not going to lie. <laughs> not not going to lie. I've seen too much of this on there. All right. Doka, sure would like to have that color. What color? Everything I'm showing you is available. Burnt red, burnt orange, yellow ochre. All of these colors are available. I have not shown any paints you can't buy yet today. I don't think. Let me re let me retrace my steps before I say that wholeheartedly, right? I haven't used any of the new colors today, so I think we're good. <laughs> now I'm being nice. I'm showing you. I try when I'm showing you specific techniques like this. I want to try to show you products that you could actually go to our store and buy. If you're new around here and don't know, uh, Creature Caster sells amazing models. We make really cool stuff. We've got our own line of paints. The Pro Acryl paints that you see me using uh, are available on our store. Uh, and so all the acrylics that you'll see me using today, that's it. All the brushes we use are our own brushes, so on and so forth. So. Bingo. I will call out when I'm using products that are not ours so that you know where to find them. Hey, Biggs Velour. And every now and then I'll use products that aren't available to the, pub the public yet, and you guys will get mad at me, and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. I accept it wholeheartedly. There has to be some upside to being the inventor of a lot of cool things. I get to play with them first. Heh. <laughs> that was very sassy. So there. I think it was Boneyard, right? Boneyard, you were asking about highlighting and stuff. We'll do that real quick. Because now the next step is, like, assume that, uh, let's put a little bit of yellow in here, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Myrtle. The paints are amazing, and I'm not affiliated with this guy. So I don't know. Are you trying to disassociate yourself or just make sure that everybody knows that you're not paid to say that? All right. So here we go with our yellow again, allowing everything to show through. Bingo, bango. Let me turn this light down a little bit. I feel like it's kind of blowing out a little bit. All right, so still letting all the under layers show through. And then once again, we'll just go through here. Closer. Do a little bit of yellow. Now, the orange is the color I want the most of, right? It's the most indicative of the rusts, right? So I'll do a little bit of yellow, but not near as much. And with the yellow, when I get it on there, tap it with my finger. Right, to blend it in. Now, when I tap it like that, you want to make sure you hit it dead on. Don't drag your finger across because you'll streak it. You just go bang. And that'll blend a little bit in there. And I'm only really going to have a few areas of yellow because none of the other chips are big enough to worry about it. Come in here and... That and bang. Call that the finger eraser. Smudge tool and Photoshop stole that from us. That's all you're doing. You're just smudging the paint. It won't take it all off. But it'll help blend these tiny areas together so that I don't have to worry about them. Super simple. Boom. Now we got rusty chips. 
And like I said, depending on the level of rusty texture that you wanted, how rusted, how long, blah, blah, you could add more and more color, right? These could be just all orange and yellow and red and not have much of the black brown showing at all, right? I feel like on vehicles that are still in service, the less rust, the better. But you might be telling a story like of some underhive dudes that got or, or gene stealer cult dudes that are driving trucks that they found in some ancient burial ground that were super rusted and they brought them back to life. Orcs might have super amounts of rust on their stuff because they're just taking rusty panels from a junkyard, throwing it together and screaming wah and, and more DACA. So you have a story to tell it, just tell it, right? The more rust you put on there, the older things are going to look. Uh, because rust, even though flash rust can happen overnight, hence the word flash rust, uh, it comes off very easy as soon as a vehicle starts moving um, because it's really just the loose particles that don't have a lot of density to them that get wet, oxidize, and that happens really quick, bam, and then it all falls off and scatters with the wind. So you don't get a real big buildup of rust on a moving vehicle, something that's in operation, all of that. But for just pure cool looks, you do all sorts of stuff. So it's starting to look good. We get a little bit of hint of rusty color in there. Didn't overpower it too much. I really like this one. It's got a texture to it. It looks like it has a dimension already. All right. Pretty nice. Okay. Uh, next, we uh, want to do some highlighting. So I'm going to get a small brush. Let's get a, a zero or something similar. Yeah, we'll go with a sable zero that I got sitting over here. The difference between all the brushes you see me using, we've got uh, the our Kalinsky sables are red-handled igniters. Um, the light blue are our artillery brushes. Those are the pure synthetic uh, heavy-duty brushes. Uh, you'll see me use those most of the time. Although lately I've been painting with a lot of the dark blue handle brushes, which are also purely synthetic, uh, but are called our deck cords. And these mimic a synthetic or mimic a Kalinsky sable brush with the way that they flex and hold paint, but they're pure synthetic, no animal hair. So pure animal hair. Kalinsky Sable that you're used to, fantastic quality, uh, highest cost. Uh, second highest cost is the deck cord, acts like a sable, um, but is a, it has no animal hair. And then the, uh, the best value that we sell is the light blue in the artilleries. All of them come in a variation of sizes, so they don't all have the exact same loadout uh, and so on. But um, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna grab a little bit of uh, bright yellow green. And we're going to highlight some of these chips. Is it bothering you guys having the palette cam on? I don't know if that even helps. Some people say they love the palette cam. Others are like, can you get rid of that? It takes up half the screen. So just let me know. I guess as long as I do a good job of keeping this on frame, then it doesn't really matter. Okay. Okay. Again, I just want my brush damp. Here, I'm not trying to thin the paint out. If anything, I really want this paint to make an impression right out of the gates. So I don't want to have to do the same line six times. So I'm going to want my paint to actually cover stuff now. But my damp brush will still uh, guarantee that uh, the paint moves off of the brush as I go to the model. Right? And so here... Again, using a stippling technique instead of, there's not a lot of spaces here to draw like a line. I'll just kind of use the point of the brush to push it onto the surface. The smaller the brush, the less paint it's going to work out of it. Kind of work around the periphery of this chunky paint a little bit. And now all of a sudden I've given it that dimension. Now the paint looks like it could be peeling away from there, right? Don't overdo it. I always say don't do this whole circumference of this thing. It gives a much better look if you just do a few pieces of it, right? So I've just grabbed a few edges. Not the whole thing, right? But now this gives it a dimension. Now this looks like I could have chipped it. This could be a real chipping technique thing. Paint could be pulling away, has a dimension to it, right? So super simple. 
Don't worry about going through and tracing the exact edge. Like I said, you just stipple a couple of dots of paint here and look at the effect. Right? Super easy. key to this in most cases is to use that kind of poking motion to get the paint on there rather than trying to draw these tiny lines. Because as soon as you try to draw a line, you overshoot. Again, I'm just going to pick some random ones, and, and they really are random. Just as my eye falls on the model, I might go in and do a little highlighting underneath some of these chips. Like we've been saying the whole time, Temper your need to make all the cool things, right? Because every time I do one of these, I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Let's make more. And the problem with making more is eventually you've made too many. Right? So that's actually pretty damn good right there. For the door. Right. <laughs> Doka's like, that's cool. Make more. Right. That's the problem. That's the problem. Because I'm just as susceptible as you guys to this. Right. I look at it and I go, wow, that's really cool. And then by the time I'm done, I'm like, oh, I overdid it. Right. It's like going to the buffet line and being like, oh, my God, give me two fried chickens. And then you get back to the table and you're like, why do I waste all this food? I can't eat all this. It's actually probably not like that at all, but it sounded like a good story, so we told it. I feel like this paint where I'm right where I'm dipping my brush has got way too much water in it. I'm having to do this line three times exactly like I said I didn't want to. My old eyes. Don't want to have to do chips over and over again. I want to do one location and move on. Right, like that. Right, so like along here, I've got probably 12 different places I could do it. If I just choose those three or four, it gives me a much better effect. It puts enough variation in it that I'm not worried now about overdoing it. Then I'll move on to the next spot. Notice how I'm doing all of my highlighting on the underside of the chip and not the top side. Just make sure that wherever you decide to put your paint, you're consistent. I've chosen that all of these will be, you know, they're not big dents in the paint. So I'm just putting it underneath where that torn edge of paint may lift off, as I said, as grit and grime and water get into the uh, the chip itself and start gravity does its work along with all of that and starts pulling the paint away from the, the surface. So generally you're going to want to uh, do the bottom side. Doesn't mean you won't have areas where you want to do it on the top. I may for a fact get a bunch of these scrapes along the back side to make it look like maybe it Something tore into it, or tried to tear into it right there. Right. 
looking pretty good for just a test little little test model here. It's even down here where we've got just darkness. We can't really see scrapes as much, you know, not even here. It's not just the camera. It's just that there's not much to see. It was so dark. But you can come in here and do the same thing. You come in and kind of add in and a little bit of stippling and texture just to break up that area and it gives it that same dimension. Uh, you'll notice I'm taking paint off on my hand. It's a little off camera, but every time I'll take the brush off screen and I'm rubbing it on my hand just to make sure I don't have a big droplet of paint on the brush because we're doing such fine detail work here. We're literally just trying to get these micro amounts of paint on the model. So if I didn't wipe it off, the chances of you coming over here and going doot and getting a big blob of paint are very high and that will make you mad. You won't be as happy as you want to be if that happens. Kathy Wappa, what is going on? Kathy says hi. Everybody, tell Kathy hi. Say hello, Kathy Wapple. James Wapple's better half. An amazing painter in her own right. Again, just get rid of most of that color. Click on that lady's name and go give her a follow. Although she streams on the More Than Dice channel, I believe. Again, being a little leery, I don't want to do, I don't want to highlight every single chip. Starts looking like a disco ball. Right. We get enough to give it that texture. Remember, rather than painting lines, I'm just dropping little pokes of bright green on there. That looked pretty cool. Nice front area. And making sure that I'm only highlighting underneath my chips. My brush didn't get much paint right then. Trying to keep the brush damp enough to have the paint flow off of it nice and neat with such a small tip. Uh, and then that versus not too wet so that the paint just flows off too easily. You got to get that happy middle ground so that when I just want a little bitty hairline of paint like I'm getting, I can do it. If you go too wet, you'll get too much paint. It'll blob up on you. Right? You won't be able to get that detailing done. I mean, we're, we're painting T90 areas here, right? There you go. Been listening to Dune House Atreides, Atreides here lately. Any of you guys and gals big Dune fans? I'm on a dune kick, so. Notice how on this one, right, and, and why I don't know, but see this little scratch here? I just did a drop of paint there, drop of paint there. Gives me a much better feel than if I just did all the way underneath, right? Much more texture because now it looks like I've got two folds of paint cracking away, but it goes closer to the model at the center. So, you know, each little spot that I'm doing gets a little bit of a different 
amount of attention. Depends on the shape of it. Depends on what I'm trying to create here. But go nuts. And I like it. So bingo. Now, Boneyard was asking, and he shall receive. He should receive. He received it. Did it, did it. Right? Did it do what you wanted it to do? Did it tell you the story you're wanting to see, Boneyard? Am I going to just sit there? I don't know if that's going to sit there or not. There. I need it like that. And again, like everything we do, you can see how you can adjust this to fit what you want to tell, right? So if you want these highlights to be brighter, go brighter, go thicker, put more paint there. Uh, brightening up the paint isn't going to have a huge effect here. It can, um, but there's still such small areas of paint that generally what you're going to need to have it more visible and be brighter is to just thicken up the paint. Thicken, I mean, do two layers of dots instead of one layer dot like, like I did, right? So you get more highlights standing out from all of that. But for what we're doing here, great stuff, right? Now we've got a texture. It looks like some of those you could walk up to and peel the paint off, right? Like right here, we get that dot, dot. And it looks like that means that the paint has kind of peeled away from there or that there's dents in the tank right there, right? As opposed to it just being a flat surface. So this is a great way to get really cool effects very quickly because all we did was sponge. No, no weird effects. Just paint it, sponge it, uh, add in the rust colors, uh, and then go in and highlight the underside of those chips, right? And you get a great effect. This looks fantastic. This, if I were going to do it on World War II tanks, like on our Puma, that's exactly the same thing I would do here. I'm not highlighting chips on these just because of the scale and because I'm trying to do the whole army pretty quick, right? But you can see how this doesn't really strip away from the realness, right, of a model. If you make this brighter, if you go through and you highlight the entire underneath of these, then it starts becoming more comical, which can also fit, right? For sci-fi models, uh, whatever story you're trying to do, uh, orcs, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to create, a lot of times that can work. So never think there's a yes and a no to this, just various levels and each one of those levels that you go as you push it changes your story a little bit more. Too much rust, too dirty to work, right? Or, or alien, right? Uh, something like this still feels very usable, but it's beat up and seen action. So this is kind of the world that I like to live in for my weathering just in general. Now, we still have lots more to do, right? We haven't done any streaking. We don't have rust streaks. Uh, anywhere there's rust, if there's wetness, moisture, do condensation in the morning, that, that rust that happens to those loose particles of metal uh, will move, right? So it'll start dripping. Gravity plays its part, right? And that will start creating oil and grime streaks, just dirt when it gets wet. Streaks down the side, especially down the side of a flat vehicle is gonna get super dirty. Uh, all of us with cars know this. It's a real pain in the butt. You love the books in the movie, but you saw the 80s version before you read the books? Yeah. I mean, the 80s, the, the, that movie is not bad at all. I enjoy watching that movie. It has a lot of story to tell in such a condensed amount of time. So, of course, there's that. Um, but uh, it's talking about Dune. Um, it, they changed some stuff that's kind of stupid, right? When you look back at it and you've read the book, you're like, oh, now I get that. Like, that's really weird. Why would you do that? What is a weirding module, right? You know, what are these things? So, but not much. Like they didn't, they didn't ruin it. I don't think. I'm really excited for the new movie. Oh, Drac, you you couldn't get into the books to read. They're heavy to some extent. They're much better as, to me as audiobooks. I've listened to the uh, all the stuff that Kevin J. Anderson and and Brian Herbert is that his son's name? Brian um, have been doing. I've really enjoyed. Some people are purists and don't like it at all because it's not Frank Herbert, right? And so it's Dune and and the original series uh, or nothing and all of the ones that they've done but the the house series books are fantastic and i think that the the super prequels are are really really good the butlerian jihad all the robot wars books i think they're really good i may be just stupid but i don't know i really dig them so the first shaking of metallics is brutal yes it can be Depending on how long they've sat or been sitting, you got to go at it. At least we, for ours, we at least we put agitators in to help. But yeah, you still have to shake them up really, really well. Doki, don't remember if you learned this from you in the past, but you do the same red, orange, yellow, rusty tones for your night. Yeah, it's the same. Well, I'm a pretty broken record when it comes to this with regards to uh, 
chipping and rust, burnt red, burnt orange, yellow ochre. As colors out of the bottle, make those colors or whatever, red, orange, yellow for rust is just kind of the, the go-to for me, right? It's the colors that we'll use for the streaking and stuff too. Now, when you get into uh, oil streak and dirt and grime, you can use blacks, you can use browns. Uh, again, all of what we do is storytelling. What are you trying to convey, right? Are you trying to convey dirty earth, you know, mud and wet and, you know, World War I trench warfare style stuff? Every time you think of it, it's like just disgustingly swampy wet, mud knee deep in the trenches. If you're trying to tell that story, you'll do a lot more weathering. You'll put a lot more grit and grime on them. The streaking can be everything from blood red and from blood and guts to, you know, brown, dirty mud and, and you know, clumps of grass on it. So, but if you do all of that and then you put it on, you know, a, a display board that's just normal dry brushed ground, those two don't interact very well. So always be trying to think of how and, and why and what and where and all of those things as you're doing an army so that you don't ever take one portion of the army too far out of stride with the rest. So if you're not willing to do the same amount of weathering on every model, probably don't do it on any individual model. That, that, and none of these are hard, fast rules. You might have a dreadnought that's been in combat for so long and your dreadnought, the story you're telling is that he refuses to let anybody clean his armor. He wants to wear the glory of battle into his thousands of years, hence. Great. Write that story, have this dreadnought, tell everybody that story. The rest of the dudes are all clean, you know, or some stage of clean because they, you know, they do the oils and the ungents and all that, you know, they, they pray to their armor and all the stuff the Space Marines do. Um, and then there's this dreadnought who's just like every mark is another symbol of my loyalty to the emperor kind of a thing. And that's a great story. And if you have one model that sticks out like that, it allows you to tell that story that way. If you've got a smattering of them, then it becomes boring. I have these five guys that all believe that this is a thing. So, but it's all up to you. It's your story. Tell it. I, mean, I tend to want to, as I pick an army and I pick how far I'm going to go, you know, I want to have most of the stuff feel like it could fit. Like even I've, although I've decided to like blow through the whole door on this, like all the paint is gone and I don't really have a story that I could tell you as to why the lower side of that door is like that. Maybe this is the side that dudes ride on and their legs and equipment hitting up against the lower part of the door is always rubbing the paint off. Whereas nobody stands on the driver's side because he yells at him and pushes them off. Fine. Great. There's a story, but it looks like, even though I've done more weathering to that area, right? It looks like it could be driving right alongside this and they look like they'd be in the same troop together. So I haven't done anything that makes one feel like it wouldn't fit with the other. And same for like the stew, right? The tank, the other, uh, the assault gun in this army, right? Still has the, the same kind of level overall, right? Of dirt and grit and grime. Still functional, still able to get its job done, fits right alongside. So nothing's overly done. Now we've already done all the, the pigments and stuff on the stew. So we've got dirt and the tracks and all that that we showed you how to do last week. We haven't done that level of detail on these yet. So it doesn't quite fit, but when I put these in frame together, bingo, they all look like, yes, these could all be part of the same force. And it's not gonna look like I bought one on eBay and I painted this one and this one's my friends that I'm borrowing. They all look like they're supposed to be there together. And so for me, that's a big deal. They don't all have to be the exact same color. Sometimes that's boring, right? So sometimes if I go in, like the greens, we did a little bit different on these two, right? That's fine. All right, so let's make sure. Now I've got, uh, why did I bring that other model on here? I got too many models on the desk. Damn, come on. All right, so the next thing that we usually try to do is that streaking. And now here's the deal. Like, who had asked about oils? Are you here? I can't remember who you are. But either Tuesday or last Friday, somebody was asking about oil paints, right? And the hype around oil paints these days, because there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of people discovering oil paints in the community and having fun with oils, which is great. They're great tools. So I went out and I bought some, because I don't use a lot of oils anymore, so boom. I, I went out and bought 12 oils. Boneyard, awesome. So boom, I went out and got the cheapest set of oils at uh, Hobby Lobby. So 12 paints for $7.99. I feel like that's a good deal. Um, what is that? That's 70 cents. I don't know. Somebody do the math. Anyway, it's cheaper than a buck of paint, right? So you get, hey, there you go. 
So uh, the only colors that I really, uh, you know, here again, I'm a broken record. Yellow ochre, black, burnt umber, right? Uh, plant green, I don't know that name. Uh, and probably scarlet red. And maybe some yellow medium, medium yellow. I don't know why it's called yellow medium. Um, so six of those colors will be used quite a bit. Lemon yellow, probably not too bright, uh, but you can use all of these. I mean, you can you can see there'd be a reason to use all of these. You could come up with something to do with all of these. The thallo green, you could probably replace. White, I don't hardly ever use in weathering, um, but I might add it to like the yellow ochre to get a little bit of a dry sandy color if I was going for it. So I might use white a lot. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Even at $7.99, if I only use these six paints ever, it would be fine. So anyway, good deal. Uh, you've got enough oil paint in this tube to last you for your entire lifespan of weathering models, probably, unless you just go way crazy. Uh, and then the other thing you'll need is white spirits. Uh, I happened to buy the Windsor Newton because that's all they had. But you can get white spirits like at the freaking hardware store. Buy it by the gallon. Right. But I was there and I needed it and I didn't have any at the studio. So I think that was the same price as the paints, right? Six ninety nine for white spirits. That's robbery. Highway robbery. But we paid for it anyway. On, a, on oil fanboy run right now. Well, the first time you start using oils on models, right, the technique allows you to get some really cool effects very quick. Um, oils are super neat in that you can be a little bit more, uh, what do I say? I, I don't want any of this to come off as negative, but when I say lazy, your application of the paint can be a lot lazier. You don't have to be as spot on because they don't dry very quick. Whereas acrylics, you got to be spot on if you're doing streaking with acrylics. You want to put that streak right where you want it. You want to make sure it's straight because you can't straighten it very easily after the fact, right? As soon as you paint it on, you're painting thin, it goes on, it's there. Oh, damn it. If I want it straight, I got to widen the line if I have like a weird ripple in it that I didn't need. Um, it, talking about streaking and stuff, right? Um, whereas with oils, you just adjust it. You can erase it and start over. Acrylics just don't allow you that flexibility. Evil Beard, what is going on? Thank you for the follow. So yeah, so they're great. And they become things that, you know, add, like like adding the chipping with the, the foam that we've done here today, right, is great. It happens super fast and it makes it super easy. And so when you do it the first time, you're like, oh my God, where has this been my whole life, right? So oils can have a little bit of that effect. Um, they are very simple to use. I'm gonna show you all that right now. Um, but the thing to be aware of, technically oils don't ever dry. They might feel dry, but the problem with using them for gaming models is that it's very easy to remove that paint from the model later on down the road. With the oils in your hand as the varnish wears thin and you pick up a model, that color can just go away, right? So if you've done really cool specific effects, like if I'd done all this kind of, you know, weirdness with that and I could pick the model up and move it around, you know, play a game, I could look back and I could have smeared the paint a year from now. Um, it's not quite that dramatic. I'm, I'm kind of overly dramatizing it uh, because we're going to be working with the oil so thin that we don't have as much of that problem. Um, but if you do like a whole thin filter layer over the top of a tank, uh, like I say, we just want to make this whole thing a little bit more orange. We can take the oil and do an oil wash over the top of the tank and do it very, very thin with kind of a burnt orange uh, and then wipe it away where we need to. It happens very quick. It looks super, super cool, but it causes a big problem with how that paint is going to exist on that model and how much varnish you have to apply to it and all the secondary effects that you have to do to it in order to make it really work. Oils have always in the hobby world, not always, I'm, I'm talking in very specifics. It's not true because you'll find people that have been using oils. I know James Waffle, Kathy's husband, uses oils all the time uh, for miniatures. Um, I typically don't recommend using oils on miniatures that get played, right? Um, but that's all up to you, okay? We'll leave it at that. Uh, we're going to do some on here, though. Uh, so we're going to do all sorts of cool stuff. The Like I said before, I did preemptively tell everybody on the stream that, you know what we ought to do? Because we've done a lot of work here, let's go ahead and I'm going to airbrush a, a coat of varnish on here real quick before we do the oil, right? Just some acrylic varnish. It'll set up pretty quick and it should be okay um, for us to then go and use some white spirits over the top of it. I don't, with all the amount of very, very light usage of paint here to get these effects, like the, the stippling of the, the rust and everything, uh, the white spirits could remove some of this. So I want to do a little bit of varnish if I have any. Hold, please. Let me see if I can go grab some real quick.
That was very easy. Evil Beard, awesome. Awesome. And thank you for the follow. But yeah, oils are great. I saw Wyatt using some oils, doing oil washes and stuff. They just, they give a great effect real quick. But it's not an effect you can't get with acrylics. So they're, they just happen a little bit easier so they can be a little bit quicker. But they take a lot longer to dry. They can cause you problems because you can't handle the model as easy right after you do the oils. Right? You're going to have to do like a layer of oil and then like, you know, set it aside and go do something else and then come back to it later. All right, let's get the airbrush. Once you're done with the oils and effects uh, and you seal it like normal with a varnish dull coat, right? Yeah. Yep. Usually let it dry for 24 to 72 hours or something like that. I err on the side of caution with that. I usually let my... Uh, my models, if I painted them with any oils at all, dry for about three days before I go back over them with a the varnish. So we've told you about on the stream what happens, like why they say you're not supposed to paint acrylics over enamels and vice versa and all this kind of stuff. Um, is Well, enamels can go over anything uh, other than the oils, right? But the um, mixing paints like that, when we're, we're not really talking about mixing them, we're talking about using them layered over one another. And the reality is that some paints take a lot longer to cure or never cure and they do what's called off-gassing, right? Off-gassing is what acrylics do as the water evaporates. Evaporation is off-gassing, meaning that the, uh, the water, as it evaporates, removes certain chemical properties from the paint, right? So that wonderful H2O that is in the medium that makes it liquidy, all of a sudden when it evaporates, you lose the liquid capability of acrylics and they become plastics, right? So acrylic is just a thin layer of plastic. It's a polymer. Just like any plastic, it's just in a base of water and uh, liquid medium. Then when all of the water evaporates out, it hardens, cures, uh, and gives you a thin layer of plastic. Uh, that's how this all goes down. When oils cure, the linseed, the liquid component of the linseed oil, and I'm not scientific enough to know the components of linseed oil from a biological standpoint, but it does, it off-gasses, right? As it cures, the liquid portion is going to evaporate, right? And uh, it happens over a much longer period of time, right? Because of the oil component. And so that gas, that air that is being evacuated from your oil paint, right? Is always coming off of the model. And if you paint over it, if you put a varnish over the top of it, then it's going to force that varnish, it's gonna move that varnish. You're gonna build up air pressure underneath the varnish and that varnish is gonna crack or bubble. So a lot of times people say like, why I painted this, you know, I, I, I dull coated my model and it bubbled up. Why did it bubble up? Because the paint underneath it hadn't cured completely yet. And it was still having air that, you know, oxygen or whatever is evaporating out of it, trying to force its way up. And if you sprayed an acrylic, which dries really fast over the top of an oil, which dries really slow, you now have a, a, a magic shell of plastic in your acrylic that is stifling and strangling the paint underneath it. So uh, enamels off gas for a long time, not as long as oils, oils off gas for a long time. And so that oil will, you know, that off gassing will push the acrylic and crack it and force it to bubble, pull it away from the model and cause all sorts of problems. So if you're painting with oils and you want to varnish with a lacquer or an acrylic, you know, polymer based deal, you just want to give it enough time to make sure that that doesn't happen. And because I can't tell you, it's different for everywhere in the world, right? It's that age old, what's the weather like where you are? Is it humid? It'll take lots longer for it to cure if it's humid. Is it super dry like here? Well, then it probably goes pretty quick. All right, so I'm just gonna use some, uh, I've got AK Ultra Matte Varnish, just an airbrush varnish, super cool. I'm gonna test it real quick. Looks good to me. This ultra matte varnish is awesome stuff. Dries almost immediately. I mean, you can, you guys see that? See where it's already, oh, I can't get it. Oh, yeah. See how it's drying? That area was moving away into the wetness as it's drying there. Q 
cures really quick. Gives a good coat. I'm going to put a couple of coats on here just because all this is fairly fresh. There we go. Wow. This stuff is so amazing. Just watch as I apply just a little bit of air to it. And it, this is two coats of this stuff. Look at that black area in the back as it just immediately mats the heck out of this model. Best airbrush varnish you can buy right here. This is uh, what I use exclusively for doing coats in between effects because of exactly what you see right there. It goes right down to the exact mat that our paint was before. Right? No sheen added at all. Our, our paints, our Pro Acryls are ultra matte, right? As far as their, their general sheen right out of the bottle. And so this varnish won't change that at all, right? No, no shine that you weren't expecting out of this. And there you go. We're gonna let that sit for a little bit uh, just because I don't want it to uh, Activate with the white spirits. Crispy Cashy, what's going on? Oh, this is AK Ultramat. Very hard to find, but it's also very, very good. Uh, took it with us to uh, Utah. And I'm surprised that I was able to find it so quick. I don't know about you guys. I'm the worst in the world about like getting home and not fully unpacking. Does that happen to anybody else? <laughs> I feel like I'm literally the worst at it. I'll be like, ah, I'll get to that later. And then the next time I travel, I'm like, where is that thing that I always use when I travel? And it's probably in the bag that I traveled with last that I shoved in a corner and never unpacked. That's the story of my traveling life. Evil Beard, you've just been spraying a thin varnish through your airbrush. Should I get an airbrush-specific varnish? Uh, no. I mean, like like a Vallejo varnish? Something like that? Like the gloss or matte varnish from Vallejo? That's all this is. You can brush varnish this, too, but most of it's meant to airbrush. I've never tried to. I've, I've probably brushed varnish this. Netwolf 38 freaking months, my friend. Good to see you again. Welcome back. Seems like the months just fly by around here. I still got to do a three-month or a three-year emote. Thank you, guys and gals, for the continued support. You're amazing. I hope that I am able to give back even a fraction of what you guys have done for us over the years. With all this asinine paint-drying stuff that you watch. Watching the grass grow with me. She travels for work and is understandably exhausted and then just never unpacks it. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. <laughs> so long, so hard. I mean, what? <laughs> Netwolf, my man. <laughs> Use Vallejo spray mat. Yeah, sure. Evil Beard. Yeah, definitely. I, I, and I've used it a lot. This is just a better quality mat than any of the other varnishes that I've seen. The Vallejo, I tend to find that the matte varnish will break a little bit and give it a satin finish. The older it gets, doesn't have to do with shaking it. Like, I, I would keep their, you know, their little bottles of paint are just their normal standard uh, varnish bottles or the same size as the normal paint bottles. But I would find that after, like, if I had that varnish for a year, that it, over the course of using it, right, it, it would get more and more of a sheen to it. So I feel like their matte medium breaks. Maybe it's temperature related. I don't know. Maybe I'm making it up. Uh, the Ultra Matte from AK, I've never, I've, I've never had an issue with it. And I've only been using the Ultra Matte from AK. I think they only came out with it maybe two years ago. But it works really well. So, right, and it's like, like I said, it's like insta dry. Now we are going to test an area of this. What say you? Um, Let's do this. Let's do this back area. Actually, let's do this this black area up front. Let's get some white spirits. I've got some in a cup here. Let's get some white spirits and let's uh, 
play around here. I can't remember which of my brushes. I always, here's the problem. So when I want to use brushes for oils, I mark them, right? And so the one with the one stripe is for color and the one with the two stripes is for white spirits only. So I don't put raw paint on this one with the two tape marks on it. And I only put paint on this one when I'm weathering, right? For painting oils as, as weathering components, that's how I do this. Uh, I would suggest you do the same. I won't use these brushes for hardly anything else now. Uh, I'll just leave them for oils. It, you don't have to do that. You clean it well, you can use it for acrylics again. I just typically am, am bad about that, so I'll want them off to the side on their own. Um, but I always mark them so that I know which one is which. Both of these are just number two uh, debt cords. Right? So the one band of tape is color, and the two bands of tape is white spirits by itself. I'm going to grab a little white spirit. Always work in a well-ventilated area. You'll notice I have the door open behind me. Right? And I'm just gonna take some of this white spirit. We're just gonna paint it on here and I'm gonna squib it kind of aggressively, as aggressive as I'll be doing any of my weathering here, just to make sure that I'm not gonna break that varnish bond and move any of my paint, which doesn't look like I am. Let's do it over uh, down here where I've got just these little green ones. Cause that's paint we just added. Looks fine, okay? So our green spots stayed, that's stuff we just added. I feel like we're okay. I always like to test. I know that the white, var the, the white spirits don't have a huge effect on acrylics uh, once they're cured, but because we're painting fast, always good to check. I would hate to be like, oh, and guess what next? We're gonna ruin the model. Not that this model's for anything, but we're trying to show you cool techniques. Uh, blah, so what do we wanna do? Um, let's do some browns first, blacks. Let's do some black and brown mixed together. Let's take burnt umber and black. I haven't opened all these. Uh, I think I've opened the burnt umber. I did open the burnt umber. Take the black. Uh, if you've never done these before, you just take the top off. It's got this little spiky thing in it. You just take it and press the top down into there and it opens it for you. And it gives you a little color on that. I don't know what that color is for. It'll never dry and it's hard to clean out of there. So you're kind of screwed. Uh, we'll do that. We'll grab some yellow ochre. Whoop. Evil beard. Thank you for that sub. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're, like I said, we're going to use some yellow ochre again, just take the cap and pop the hole in it so you can actually use the stuff. Uh, we don't need the plant green for this. We probably want a little bit of the red. Yes, no, maybe. Probably not, but we're going to open it anyway. Scarlet. Red. And then we'll take a little bit of medium yellow. Again, I don't know that I'll actually use this for anything. And we'll actually take some white, too. See how much I love you, Boneyard? Went out and bought all of these yesterday. So that I could uh, show you guys this. Let's, uh, let's get rid of this piece of palette paper. It's got some oil on it from the burnt umber. I just wanted to test these pigments. I've never used these paints before from Masters. So always good to just kind of get an understanding of what the pigment is like in any paint you're about to use. Goes without question. So I just want a little smear of paint. Oils are nice because you can just put them all out on the palette. They don't dry up. It's great. Don't need much. We're just doing weathering stuff. So that one had a little bit more oil in it. Uh, if you don't know the, the components of uh, oil paints, the medium is linseed oil. Right. You can add more linseed oil to it. We'll give it a longer open time. means it won't dry near as quick. Put some black over here. Uh, and they make thinners that will, uh, we're just using white spirits, but they do make thinners that will, uh, in, uh, what am I trying to say? That will shorten the dry time substantially uh, that are just called thinner, oil thinners. They make water-based oils which is weird, but I think Winsor Newton makes some water-based oil components that are uh, thinners that you can mix and varnishes and stuff. I have not used a lot of that because I don't sit in the world of oils very often. Um, 
I just am a white spirits guy. White spirits, done. Uh, it's always worked for me. But they make they do make stuff that will help you with it drying faster. Uh, I have not used those things on models with acrylics, so go for it. Try it. <laughs> Ray, woo! Computer still broke. Love your face. I love your face. I, I I didn't realize you hadn't fixed your computer yet. I was like, where the hell is Ray? Yeah, I was like, where is Ray? Why do we have no Ray? Okay, so let's just do some stuff. So I, the first thing I want to do is do some black and brown together. So my one tape band brush is the paint color brush. So I'm just take a little bit of black, take a little bit of brown, make a new color. Call it black brown. I know, amazing, right? I don't like using just the black for the sooty stuff. Uh, I got my little bitty cup of white spirits here, and so I'm just going to do a little white spirits. And just like I would with a normal acrylic, I'm just going to come out here and thin it down with a bunch of white spirits. Okay? Same exact thing that you see me doing all the time. All right, so now I'm going to come over here and let's, uh, oh, I don't know. I don't want soot stuff necessarily coming out of the rust streaks. Let's do it like down off the end of this, right? So I'm just going to take this and I'm going to paint some lines here. All right, just coming down, just randomly, like so. Okay, those are a little symmetrical, but who cares? All right, just paint some lines like that. All right, I set my brush down because oil isn't going to dry, and then I grab my two-banded brush and just put white spirits on it. You don't want a whole lot, right? But you want it wet enough. And then I'm just going to come in here and kind of move those streaks around. All right, get them from being lines; they're just going to be blurred out now hopefully you can see what that's doing right, is I'm using the clean brush to come in and alter those all together Right, so I can take what was a very thick line on this side and turn it into just very thin, stringy drips. Right, this line over here, maybe that's too straight for me, so I just come in and kind of break it up, stipple it around, bring some of that over here. Right, bring a little bit of that down, just kind of feather it around. Right. So now I've created this kind of grit and grime streakiness coming down from you know whatever this is, this exhaust port thing. That's how easy oils are, right? And we're going to do a lot of this, so if I'm moving fast, don't worry about it, right? I'm gonna, we're going to come back to this. Right? So let's go back and uh, grab a little bit more. Oh, my God, this is going to kill me. This is so out of norm for where my stuff is located on my desk. Right? Okay, so let's just go in. I've got a more of the black-brown. I did it right on the wrong brush, so that's good. But I'm just going to come in and stipple it around this set of rivets. Like so. You notice how the linseed oil kind of drips outwards, right? So that's going to give you a little bit of a blur on that. Then I can kind of come back in and just kind of streak that down. Clean this brush real quick. Right. And see how I've got like a hard edge to this? I can come in and very easily disrupt that edge, feather it out. So, right. so now less of a hard edge on that one side. Same thing over here. I can erase it entirely. If I don't like this at all, I can come back in, get rid of it. And come back in and take make sure that I just kind of feather this stuff around the rivets so I don't get that kind of circle of color. I can just kind of do like this. Grab a Q-tip, smudge it with a Q-tip. Right, and get back to where I started. If I'm like, oops, that didn't work. All right, so now I've erased it. I can come back with my correct brush. Paint another streak coming down. 
streak over here. Grab my brush that just has the white spirits on it. Again, kind of work that line the way I want to, to make it look like a drip and not a line of paint. Kind of streak it down. And I can continue playing with this however I want. I can go back in on top of these now. I got this is the hard part for me because I gotta remember to grab the right brush here. Let's grab a little bit of the white spirits and let's do the yellow ochre next. Back over here, and let's say I wanted to drag in a little bit of yellow ochre in that. I can do just a little spot of yellow ochre right down the center there. Brush with the white spirits again. Pull it right through that yellow ochre. Right. And bingo. I can give it a little bit of a color change. But again, I don't have a line of paint. I've blurred that, right? Same thing. The, the problem is I can't touch this, <laughs> right? So if I handle this tank, if I want to do like this side of the tank and then grab it and turn to the other side, I'll be wiping all this stuff off. It takes a long time to set up, right? But it gives you a bunch of really cool components and things that you can do. So I did this streaking. See how this streaking now that the, the white spirits have evaporated? Notice I have this streak line stuff coming down here. I can come back in like right next to that, bring in some of this yellow ochre color. Right. Keep wanting to dip it right in my water. Again, just get a clean brush, just damp with mineral spirits. And blur that yellow however I need to. And now I'm adding more color to the streaks as I go. Now doing this with an acrylic, you don't have the flexibility. You can't just paint a line of paint and then come back and smudge it as easily. You can still do it to some extent, but it's, it's harder. Now, if we wanted to go in, let's go in with some brown off of some of these rust spots. Again, I'm treating this basically just like acrylic. I'm adding white spirit instead of water to get this soupy coloring here. And I can just come off of, uh, let's say, this nice spot that we got right here. Going a little bit thicker. Something like that. With the oils, like I said, I can just kind of randomly put it on there. I don't have to worry about, you know, is that the way it needs to look? I don't, not in a rush. Come back over here, grab my brush with just a little bit of white spirits on it. I can move those lines however I want. Blur them out entirely. All right. Okay. So that line of paint has now been turned into a drip coming out of our rust area. And then we can build up stuff down here like we have, and we can take the same thing and just kind of run it along the bottom of the door. We can move the paint for a lot longer. Back and grab some more burnt umber. Now that it's built up down here, go right over our edge highlight with some burnt umber. 
and then drag a couple of streak marks pretty thick off of that. Now with an acrylic, if we did that, that's what we would get. It would just be this forever now, right? But because we're doing it this way and we're messing up completely and using the, I'm just gonna, I've already done the wrong brush too many times, right? we went from having hard, thick lines of drip to now we just have that very faint drip coming down. And look at this. Now that the white spirits have dried, right, we still have the dimension we wanted for that drip coming down. Much more subtle than just the hard line we put on there. And we get very realistic kind of streaking effects. See how we've done it over here? As all this stuff starts drying, we start getting really good discoloration. Right. Really cool stuff. Now I can come back in the middle of that that we just did with, uh, let's do a little bit of mix of the red. Grab a little red. Grab a little yellow ochre over here. Make a burnt orange real quick. Brown. There we go. Okay. We'll come in, just kind of stipple that down that same streak that we just created. We don't have to be specific because I've shown you. We can fine tune this as we need. Right. But now we can start adding in some dimension. Right, we can have these kind of, not really dimension, but just a little bit more life to it. Right? So on that thinned out backdrop that I created, now I've got the ability to do this nice, heavy streak. And then I'll come back in with some white spirits and just streak it a little bit more. Move around just a bit. So, just to help blend it into the background just a little bit. Go in. Use a little airbrush air here. Help the white spirits go away. And now we've got that nice rusty color. If you thought, well, maybe that's a little too orange for you, didn't want that much, All right? Take this back, a little bit more white spirits on it. Down like that. Get a little white spirits on our Q-tip. And basically, I can erase that whole area. Then I'd be like, okay, do over. Right over the top of that, again, maybe bring that orange, but not so much. Maybe just a little bit up at the top this time. Like so. And use the white spirits to streak. I got it at an odd angle for me, so I'm probably making my streaks not quite straight. So I'm trying to keep it visible to you guys. So apologize if my geometry is off a little bit. Right. They were able to tone it down a little bit, still keep that rusty color on there, and just keep playing. This is the power of oils, right? We can do this till our heart's content. We can continue to keep doing these streaks, erasing them if they're not right, 
um, you know, by using the Q-tips. Now I'm using these Q-tips that are very stiff. I would suggest using a regular Q-tip. The pointed ones are very hard, um, so they will move it in a more defined pattern, but they won't just soak as well. So get some normal Q-tips um, and you'll be able to soak a lot of that white spirit up better, right? So, but for us, there's our, our streak that we've created. Right? And unlike an acrylic, there's no hard edges to it because we were able to kind of, you know, blend all that out. And now you just keep doing this wherever you want. Again, it goes kind of without saying when we go careful, <laughs> if you just make a billion streaks, right, you're going to cause yourself some problems. Okay. Repray, what's going on? Skinny Boots, uh, question about AK varnish. You have AK matte varnish. Just wondering what ratio of varnish and flow improver you recommend. I don't thin varnishes. Like I just shot the varnish through here straight out of the bottle. I didn't add anything to it. No water, no, no anything. For varnishes and for primers, I try not to thin them. I might thin down a gloss varnish a little bit because, you know, it, it can build up texture. But generally, I don't. Robosh, how would you do dirty oil stains around the engine? Same kind of deal, right? Um, let's do, what do I have? Let's do it on the Puma. Right? I wasn't going to do a whole lot of oils on the Puma, but we don't have a really good spot on this because, unfortunately, I didn't, uh, I didn't paint the rest of this. This has been around for a long time. So uh, let's move that one out, and let's bring in the Puma real quick. Because we do have an engine deck lid on the Puma. Now this, let's, let's compare... Right, so I haven't done any, well have I? Yeah, I did a, did a little bit of streakiness on here. This is all done with acrylics, right? So the Puma is all done with acrylics. So all of the pen washing in between the panels is all done with our transparent brown. So I wanted to be able to use this as a way to show you that you can get very similar effects. So before we do the deck lid, if you don't mind, right? Before we do the engine spill, oil spill stuff, but keep, keep typing in chat if I, if I look like I'm gonna forget it. I want to show you a little bit about how to do the pen washing with the oils. We've talked about grit and grime and streakiness here, right? Which I feel like hopefully you guys kind of understand. Is this helping? Does this give you, I mean, we've got like, you know, when, when water and rain come down here, you just got a thin streak of dirt color that even over the, the shadows gives you a little bit of light dirt dry and crusted on there, right? Right? So you can get all of these really cool colors going on and cool effects, right? This vertical streaking across the, the tank, right? And we'll do more with the oils. Don't feel like we're done. Um, but by using the white spirits, we've made it translucent so that all of our highlighting on our edges still shows through. We haven't covered anything up. You know, we've got a really, really cool effect going on here. Problem number one, right, is that if I go like this, look at that yellow vertical line that I had wiping my finger across there, what did I just do? I just erased the entire drip that we did right there. And it's been like that for half an hour. And I was able to take it off with just my finger, nothing on my finger. That's the problem with oils when painting hobby stuff. Because typically, right, we have to paint a three-dimensional object. Painting a three-dimensional object with oils creates its own version and hassles. Because you might want to do both sides of the tank at once. You've, you're, on a, you're on a roll, right? I've got this streaking. It's freaking perfect. I love it. So you turn the tank around. What's going to happen? Right? What happens as soon as I turn it on? <laughs> Greenleaf, take your shirt off. I already did earlier. You missed it. Right? So now you'll have your greasy fingers on the backside and you'll move all that paint. So be careful, right? I, I, just be careful. You can shoot a varnish over it in order to protect it right now, and it'll seem like it's okay, and then that varnish might crack because the off-gassing of the oils as it continues to cure for two, three days um, can cause problems. For streaking and stuff, not as much because we just don't have a whole lot of oil paint on this model, right? But I just showed you how even after 30 minutes, I just erased an entire drip area. All the color is back to where we started here, right? Do the same thing over here. Take that, it's just gone. So you got to be careful when doing this. You might you, you start staging your models a little bit differently as you start using oils. Um, because, again, they're three-dimensional. You have to rotate them around, hold them in different ways, and you're going to rub the paint off. So as you're doing this streaking, plan on just doing like a side, maybe the side and the front. You know, you can hold it in one place and do the side and do the front and then let it sit. And then come back, you know, the next day and do the other side and the back maybe. Right. So it's a little bit longer. It's quick to make the effect happen on the model. It's longer to finish the model than acrylics are, okay? 
Um, let's do, let's, I, I, I still want to, I want to do some comparison shopping style stuff. So let's do some streaks on here using acrylics. Okay. How about that? So we'll do some acrylics and we'll do some streaking kind of right next to this area that we've done with oils. We'll do it with acrylics with our transparent paints over here. And, and we'll see like, what's the difference? You know, how do you like it? How does this work? So on and so forth. Then we'll start doing some, some oils. We'll do some pin washes and we'll show you how all of this stuff can go together. Um, so let's take some more transparent brown. So I'm going to put them on the same palette now, but our transparent brown is very, very close. I've mixed our, our trans brown with some trans black and I've got a very close to the burnt umber color. Um, I'll need some orange transparent to take the place of what we created over here. And I'll have to mix that with our brown most likely. So these are our very own Pro Acryl transparent acrylics. Um, I'm using the sample bottles that we get from our factory, but um, don't worry, they're, they're exactly the same as the small bottles. I just have them in huge quantities here, so I'm cheating, basically. Right. So we get some brown, some orange, and some yellow, like that. All right, and then we grab paintbrushes that do not have white spirits all over them, preferably. Grab our number two that we were using earlier. Ta-da. These away from over there. There we go. All right. All right, so let's do some of this. So first off, and I got to, oh, my God, I'm going to have to retrain myself, right? Now I'm used to sticking my brush in the white spirits. Now I'm going to put freaking uh, my acrylic brush not in the water. I'm going to put it in the white spirits. The pain of teaching oil versus acrylic all at the same time, right? So I'm going to take the, uh, the transparent brown, and again, just with water, Right, just thin it out, like so. Okay, super thin, more like watercolor, even more so than watercolor thin. Right, so this is the kind of you know hint of brown that we're getting out of this. Okay, we'll come in now because the white spirits thinned out our thick paint and gave us transparency on the oil. The transparent paint is transparent right out of the gates. We just got to put it where we want it. Right, so I'm gonna kind of just bring this. Brown down here like this. Streak it down from this area like so. Kind of use my finger, smack it around a little bit. Give it that blur effect. Again, I apologize for my geometry. My lines are kind of going towards the back because I got the model held at a weird angle so that the camera can see it. All right, so that's gonna be a little funky. I apologize that my lines aren't straight up and down here. Oh, to be a streamer. Okay. I've got the brown background on there. I'll grab a little bit of the orange and the brown together. Some water, not white spirits. <laughs> Now that's already dry, so I don't have to worry about with the oils. I just have to make sure that I get the look I want right out of the gates because I can't move that anymore. So that over here, I'd still be able to manipulate. Over here, I can't. Now it's dry. All right, so then I'm going to take and do the orange the same way I did over there. Streak down. By using my finger to blur it like that, I'm getting a very similar effect. Right. I'm fine. Use the airbrush to get that dried off real quick. So you start seeing right? That this is not just uh, apples and oranges. You can do the same thing with both, right? You, the mechanism that you use to do it might change a little bit. The overall outcome and the amount of, of attention you have to pay is different, right? It's easy with the oils. I just put paint on, squib it around like I want, don't like it, erase it with white spirits, start over, do it a million times, don't care. Easy to learn, uh, easy to recreate. 
with the acrylics, I got to be more specific because I can't erase that acrylics that I've done, right? So if I want to have some more over here dripping down, I've got more of that brown on here, right? So I've got to have it real thinned out because I need that kind of transparent streakiness going on. I have to define that shape right out of the gates for it. Right, so I get the dimension I want, then I can come back and grab some of this orange brown mix. This I'm not thinning out as much because I want this to be a little bit more pinpoint to give us our actual streak. Hit it with my finger, that does the blur. So I just have to be more careful, more precise with what I'm trying to do over here on this side, but I can make the same effect. Now the nice thing with the oils, they're gonna give you a much easier blend on the edges. You can see how the acrylics will give you a little bit more of a hard edge around them, right? You just have a very hard time blending all that out. Now I can take a brush, Grab something with a little bit more stiffness to it if I got it over here. Yeah, like a little bit thicker brush. Put some water on it. All right, because our paints have a little bit longer open time than most, I can take a wet brush. Right, I can kind of go in and squib these a little bit. And I can thin those out like I did with the oils. Realize that's something specific to our paints. You're not going to find that, and, and specifically our transparent paints, you're not going to find that in other people's acrylics. Okay? So I, I kind of hinge on whether I should have shown you that. Be, I, I want you to know because now you'll buy our paints. But our paints, like that acrylic was sitting there for a minute, right? We were able to go back with just water. That wasn't white spirits. The white spirits wouldn't have done anything. Just water. And I can squib this around and I can still move my color a little bit. It's not as much as oils, right? But I can still move that color around. I was able to get rid of a lot of that buildup of orange down at the bottom. Okay. So you do have the ability to do some fun stuff, but don't get used to that being the case with acrylics, right? So I can make our acrylics look almost identical to the oils. Um, other acrylics aren't going to work that way. Our medium right, is our medium, and it allows a little bit longer open time, and especially when you're using it that thin, you can come back and you can move it around a little bit, but I wouldn't have been able to wait like 30 minutes and rub it off like we did down here, right, give it a couple more minutes, and this will be completely dry, and I won't be able to do anything with it, okay, so just a, just a particular to pro acryl, you can make pro acryl work a little bit more like oils, Right? We're always careful when we say that. We just have a longer open time with our acrylics, right? They're, they will be able to be re-enlivened uh, uh, for a little bit longer. You know, five, ten minutes, you can be working around, but you're, they're not going to move like oils. They're not going, you're going to basically erase them. You're not just going to be able to blend them out like the white spirits do with the oils. Every time you just take a little bit of white spirit to an oil, it'll blur it, right? Um, if you take the water to our acrylics, it will allow you to move, like get rid of a hard edge, but it won't be because you're blurring it. It's because you're kind of erasing it and feathering it manually. Okay, so just be aware of that, all right? But altogether, either or, right? We can do streaking and both acrylics and oils will look fantastic. It's up to you, however you decide you want to do it. Uh, okay, pin washing we wanted to do, okay? Pin washing and oil pooling and things like that. Would your magical clear model holding material help with handling the model when, it, when you use oils? Any amount of pressure on it. Now, yes, the oils from your, your hands are going to create more of a problem. So if you have gloves, you run a little less risk, right? Like the nitrite or nitrile free, the, you know, the, the regular gloves, like the medical gloves. Or, or it's not just going to rub it and move it easily, but it still can. So just be careful. <laughs> Start streaking. Nice, Robosh. Make sure I'm not missing any questions. Is everybody just soaking it up? We're talking about a lot of new stuff that we don't normally do on stream, 
So that's good. Um, what do I have? Do I have another model where we could do... This one doesn't have... I mean, it does. But see, I've already... The problem here, I thought I was going to be perfect, but this guy's already got like Nuln oil that I did when we did this one-on-one -on -one session for showing how to uh, airbrush a tank. For some reason, I put Nuln oil around there already. Just real quick and sloppy. So adding another pen wash on here isn't going to really show you much in contrast to what we've done here, right? So all of these panel lines in between like the doors and all the shadow around the hinges is all done with our brown transparent paint. So again, like the in here, right? All down the side, the pen washing inside all of these, inside of the lock area and all that is all done with our thin down brown transparent paint, much like we just did um, on there. So I'm trying not to use a lot of oils on these because I'll forget that I did it and then I'll handle it and then it'll be a pain in the butt. Um, but we can't because I just don't think it's going to show us much on that guy. Uh, let's try. Let's try. I'm like, I'm all, I don't really want to do this. All right, so let's take uh, some white spirits again. Don't tump over the cup, please. Let's grab some of the umber over here. Here, when I'm pin washing, I try to thin it down. I don't want it really thick. I want it to, again, be a fairly thin paint. Back this out a bit. And if I come over here, now I can just kind of touch the brush in, and that paint will slide along inside there. So that if I get a little bit more white spirits up here, yeah, like that. Yeah. So I don't have to draw these lines, right? I can just kind of touch the brush there and it fills the gap with uh, paint, right? So come over here. Kind of tap the brush along, right? And all of that gets down into those recesses. Same thing like down in this inset of the door here and all of these crevices i can give it kind of a good dirty oil injection oh oh right along these lines here, make sure I get it in there. Don't care about it being a little sloppy. Normally I would do this before we do any of the streaking because it will kind of run along what we just did with our oil streaking. We're gonna move some of that paint here in a second. We just take some white spirits. Any of the areas where we got a little out of the lines, well, it's going to be hard to tell, right? You can see the sheen, though, around the outside. So you just come back in and blur all that back. Just kind of squib your brush right along the outside on just the top surface, right? And that'll help blur all those lines. So because that paint doesn't dry very fast, really, really simple to make sure that you don't get that same halo that you would with, I'm going to be real careful right through here because we have that other oil is still going to move around. Right, but I'm just basically moving the white spirits around. It'll blur all that paint that went around the edges. Same thing around the edges here. Just outside the constraints of all these pieces. And so it'll keep all of the pen wash inside the crevices. You can clean it off of the face of it. A lot of people uh, will choose rather than a pen wash, they'll just do an overall wash early on it, before we had done all the rest of this stuff. Um, you would do like a, a complete wash. You take a lot of this oil and like null oil, you just slop it over the top of here. And then you can take your Q-tip, right? And clean the top of all these areas off, right? You can come back in and just wipe the oil off the high spots and it'll stay down in the low spots, okay? Because it's so workable, 
you can do all of this, right? You can just play around with it, keep moving it around, right? Get it off the high spot so that that brown just sits down inside those crevices. I don't want it on the outside. Bingo, done, right? So you can do oil washes all over an entire model uh, and then wipe away where you don't want it to sit. And, and that will kind of like reverse dry brush almost, right? All the paint stays low because the Q-tip can't pull it out. And the Q-tip will just continue to remove, you know, small amounts of the, the color, okay? But like I said, it's not too different than what we're doing over here when we're just going through with water. and the brown transparent acrylics. All right, so I can take this, and where do I have something that I could do here? Uh, I like right in here. Drop it in there, and then just take my finger and clear it off of the top side, right? Same exact process, except that you don't have the amount of time to play around with it. So all of this was done the exact same way. I would just come in here. You're, this is just washing. This is just pen washing, right? But if I get a little bit on the outside, I just have to wipe it away quickly with my finger to leave it all down in the recesses. I don't have the ability with the acrylics to have that long open time. Again, our paints are a little bit longer, right? But I'm going to have to apply the paint, clear it off immediately, move on, and assume that that part is done. I can't come back to these. I can't like do, you know, three or four different, five different areas, and then come back with water and expect to clean them all up. Got to do it as I go. But you can see that I still get like the dark paneling around all these doors was done that way. This streak, oily streak here, all of this area over the fender, right, done the exact same way. So I can just come in and just kind of poke color along in there with the transparent and then wipe the top of the fender and all of it stays in that trough on the top. So I get the same general effect. Poke it onto this hinge, wipe the top of the hinge off. Top of the hinge is clean, brown around the dirty, corroded part of the hinge. Very, very similar. All right, same thing if I want to do it down here. I can go in and throw in randomly some stuff there, wipe off the top so that the top of the hub and the top of the wheel don't have it, but that brown dirt now sits inside. All right, it's the same thing over here. I just can't be as crazy and freewheeling as I would have been with the oil. And I got to move quick, right? Here, you're on a clock. do each wheel individually, wipe off the tops, still get the stuff in the recesses, all the paints off the top, right? Works like a champ. And this, just by preference, this is the way I like to do it. Um, the oil streaking definitely can look super, super good. I just am always very leery about models I'm going to push around the table using it that way. Thing on this outer edge. Right. Super easy. All right, now, oil stains. Oil stains are just different color, right? So let's, uh, let's do it on the side of this tank again. We'll come back here. Let's do it on this axle in the back. This is like the, the axle 
here. So let's assume there's like oil and grease. Uh, the question was posed as like on the deck lid, you know, and oil spills on the deck lid. We're just going to do it here flat, like axle grease and oil coming up out of this, this area here. So again, I'm going to grab some white spirits. I'm going to come over here and grab a little bit of black. Pure black, I think, for oil. Less brown and dirt in it. Maybe a touch of brown in here, but not too much. Mostly black. And then I can just simply, again, because it's oil, I can just kind of throw it all over the place around here. You can imagine if this were, you know, it's been, was wet at one point, but it is now just slick. Kind of spot it all around there. Maybe grab some of the thicker paint. Put a little bit more pigment in towards the center. Gravity's got the, the thick grease on the bottom here. So you can do just like that if you want it to be thick and oily. You can then grab your cleaner brush with a little bit of white spirits. And you can use that white spirits to just kind of poke around, blur it out a little bit more. I like for oil, I, I like the, again, the stippling texture is just great, right? Because it gives it that kind of splotchy feeling, right? Let it come back in here and just kind of stipple those edges, fuzz them around, maybe streak that down a little bit like we did before. Like finger painting again, right? You get to play, do your thing. Just feather it out to where it doesn't look like it's pooled in one area by taking this no color, just white spirits and spreading the edge out, right? Now I get greasy, oily axle. Okay, so on that one, the key for me was take a very thin layer of it first, poke out and outline where you want it, then take more heavy pigment and go in on the center so you get that thick kind of grease drip right there. Because I'm looking for, when I'm doing oil and grease, I'm looking for like, that's disgusting. If I touch that, it's going to goop up and all over my finger, ah, wipe it on your pants, big mess, right? Water's not going to cure that kind of a thing, okay? Super simple, super quick. That, don't go anywhere near it for a while. Because that ain't going to dry quick. No matter how much air you throw at it and how dry it seems to the visual, you rub your finger across it, it's going to go away. Okay? So be very careful. That's just the big pain with oils. Art image, it's fine on my end. You got bad interwebs? All right. So that would be exactly the same way I would do it if it were flat on like a deck lid, right? So again, like on the stew, right? We've done some stuff like that that I think we did on stream. We did like, uh, where, yeah, yeah, like see, we've got that greasy kind of oily drip out of the tail light area on this thing, right? That was all done with acrylics. So no oil is done here, right? And the same thing, like a little bit of, of dingy kind of drip around the edges and corners here. Right, same thing, kind of oily hinges. And that was all done, all of this was done with acrylics. Right. But again, the only fear with oils, I mean, the amazing stuff that you can do for your details and effects are, are just that, they're amazing, right? It's just gonna be, you gotta leave it alone, right? You gotta get it where you want it and then move on to something else. So a lot of times it means, having other projects, right? Besides this tank that you wanna work on when you're dealing with oils. Um, you know, you go back to, oh, I'm gonna do the side of this and do all the streaking and the oil stuff because it looks amazing, right? But I can't handle this tank, right? I can't go do the other side because unless I can not touch that and remember to not touch it when it's out of sight and do this side, right? So generally you'll do a part of it, do the turret and set it aside, you know, do the top of the body. I mean, maybe if you've got it, a lot of times what you'll see is people will have like drill a hole in the bottom. So you have a stick you can hold so you can turn it around. So you can do the whole thing and never have to touch the tank. 
So model holders are very, very important when doing oils. Um, you know, have a stability thing, drill a hole in the bottom, put a stick in it, rotate it around so you can paint all sides of the vehicle without having to do it. Have something you can stick the stick in so you don't have to lay the tank over on its side and areas where it's going to, you know, cause you problems. But you can get really good effects. Amazing stuff. And literally, it's just oils. I mean, you've seen it. It's oils and white spirits. I'm just, I've got just a, a little cup of white spirits over here that I've been dipping my paintbrush in, right? That's it. Not even using clean ones. I'm just using the same white spirits as it gets more pigment built up in it. I don't care. It's all the same rust, oil, and dirt on the tank. So having a little bit of pigment intrusion isn't going to kill anything for us. It's because he's Canadian. Yes. <laughs> Everybody say hi to Jen. Say hi, Jen. So, Robosh, does that help? Does that give you the greasy, oily deck lid feel that you were thinking about? I got more I want to show. So let me know if anybody has questions about what you've seen so far, right? I don't do a lot of all-over washes, so it's just never been part of what I do. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't do that, like we talked about. Uh, I just I don't have a vehicle set up to do that with for oils right now because I want to be painting on my other ones. So if I do an all-over oil wash, i got to leave it alone for a while. Um, so I typically don't do that. My airbrush style doesn't really require it, right? So the way that I've airbrushed like this truck doesn't require that I do an all-over oil wash. I have darkness in the crevices where I want it, and I'm very specific about that as I airbrush. Did I build that up subconsciously so I didn't have to worry about washes? Maybe. Um, I never have really liked all over washes because they change the entire color of a thing and it makes it difficult to highlight back up off of it. So you kind of have to have a knowledge of what your wash is going to turn your color into if you do it all over the place. Um, if you do an oil wash and you wipe it all off, you get back to your original color. But I've just learned that, you know, I can control my airbrush so I get the dark, dingy interior stuff without doing any washes. So there's no washes on this at all. I'll probably go back and pin wash a little bit in the darkest recesses with brown just to bring an earthy tone into it, like dirt and dust, um, you know, for whatever environment I'm pretending this thing is in. But other than that, I don't worry about it. Um, but like we talked about, you could just take a very thinned out oil like what we've got and rub it all over this thing and then wipe it off in the areas you didn't want to. And I'll, I'll try to get a model prepped so that we can do something like that. Although I know a lot of people are using oils as washes, um, on Twitch and on the various channels here recently. So you should be able to find people doing that. Are we still on? Why did everybody stop talking? Are you afraid of me? Oh, now that art image has shown up, we are seeing some, some dips. We are seeing some dips in service right now. Hopefully that goes away. All right, because I want to show you some other tricks. So if nobody has any questions, I'm going to move on. We're going to show you some other weathering tricks. Uh, it also includes white spirits. Okay, so I'm going to, this time I'm going to use fresh white spirits, though. So I'm just going to go straight to the bottle of white spirits. I'm not going to use the colored stuff because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hopefully blow your mind here with some stuff. Hopefully we'll blow your mind real quick. I want to show you some cool stuff that you can do that doesn't include oil paints and isn't quite as bad. It gives you the same effect, but isn't quite as bad on the cleanup and stuff. Uh, terracotta, burnt orange, canary yellow. I, think I have a yellow ochre, don't I? Aha, I do. What is this? This is called yellow orange. That sounds better. So we'll do that and yellow. Do I have black? Is there black in here? Black. Ta-da! Black. All right. Cool. Look. Look. Pencils. These are just, what are these called? Spectra colored design. These are cheap ass colored pencils, but they're not chalk. They're wax. So they're oil. Air quotes, oil. Right? Has chat not been working? <laughs> Has chat not broke? 
All right, Twitch being Twitchy. All right, so we've done this. We're going to set this guy aside. I think we got the good oily axle. I'm hoping Robosh, Robosh hadn't typed. I'm hoping Robosh saw this and that uh, this kind of covers what you were talking about as far as like, you know, gritty, grimy, oily stuff. So I'm going to put that aside right now so I don't touch it and ruin the oils on there. And now we're going to talk a little bit about this. These are literally just cheap. I've had these for years, right? So when we've used colored pencils on the stream, these are the colored pencils we've used. Um, they just need to be waxy. You can always tell. You can just kind of take your finger and they'll either feel like a Crayola right? Or they'll chalk and you'll get dust. Here, they're like Crayola. If I scrape on here, I don't get a lot of dust. And what I do is, you know, waxy. So more like a Crayola. These are basically just, you know, uh, cooler Crayolas, right? So we're gonna do some weathering with these. Ta-da! Uh, let's do these on the turret. I'm not, I'm not as afraid of doing my Puma with these. Because even though we're going to use white spirits, we're going to do it in a different way. All right. Well, not a different way. We're going to do it the exact same way that we did with oils, but we're going to use pencils. All right. So strap in. We're going to do some fun stuff here. Uh, I want a real brown, though. How about this? What's this called? Dark brown. Sounds good. Asking you shall receive. All right. So we got dark brown. So let's just go and do some streaking on the side. We're just going to do it from the top. All right. We're just going to go through and do some... Quick streaking. Now, this is really nice because it's a pencil. You can draw. If you can if you can write, this becomes very easy. All right, so I'm just going to take and I'm going to draw with my colored pencil. All right, just some makeshift streaky stuff. All right. Streaks. I'm going to grab my brush that I was using before. Make sure it doesn't have any of the pigment from the white spirits on the other one. And I'm just going to dip it in the white spirits. Okay. Probably shouldn't put white spirits on the side of my thumb. We're just going to use it to Hey, Ma, look, no oils. Now, because there is no linseed in this, as I add white spirits, I do have to be careful because it will um, just kind of move the pigment around. These are hard pigment pencils, so the carrier is a little different. The white spirit still breaks it all up, right? Still moves it around, but I can get, you know, pigment built up in weird ways if I'm not careful. I'm keeping my brush strokes fairly linear. All right, bingo, we got that. Let's do some orange. This is good. Burnt orange, or what is this? Burnt ochre? Burnt ochre? That's like burnt orange and yellow ochre. This is like the best thing ever. Every couple of scrubs, I will take this off to the side and just kind of wipe the brush off. All right, still feathering stuff down, but it'll get loaded up with pigment. And so I'll just take it over to the side, wipe it off. Okay. A little bit of yellow.
How about them apples? Ta-da! Pencils. Who knew? Right? So that's a way to get the... Right? Very similar effect. Good streaking, great blur, no hard edges if you don't want them, right? You can use whatever colors of pencils you buy, right? So let's get a, what is this? This looks like silver, unfortunately. I don't want silver. I have a gray, like a light gray. I don't feel like it. So there's white here, maybe. Oh, there's a blue gray. What is this? Slate gray, perfect. Perfect. All right, so we can. Go to your heart's content. You can see how it takes the pigment and blends it over the surface. So I'm getting that dirty surface out of this, as opposed to back here where we haven't done any yet. That's why I divided it down that middle there with that streak. But notice how our streak still blurs and goes away completely. This is too much for you, like, like here. It's a little heavy. Back in. Get rid of that streak. Super easy. So pencils that have that, you know, Crayola oil pastel feel to them, right, can work very well. Now, I don't know what that means brand wise. You might get some that don't work as well. I would just test it. This cheap set that I got design Spectra Color works great. And it comes with a bajillion do pencils in it, like literally or I don't know, eight, 40 pencils looks like no six 48 pencils holy crap yeah six by eight 48 colors you'll never use most of them but the ones you do use work like a champ now the key with this there's always a caveat right so the the best as far as like maintenance uh quick down and dirty to get it done in my opinion is this um this will not do the oily buildup stuff because it isn't a liquid Right? And so I can't get this same kind of drip and liquid effect going on. So oils and acrylics are going to be your best bet for doing liquid effects. The pencils will only do the streaky stuff that isn't meant to really feel. It's meant to feel like dry dirt streak. Pencils, bar none, some of the quickest and easiest ways to do that. Um, and, and they're pretty good. The problem is you need to varnish them pretty quick. Uh, you can varnish them quickly, though, because there's no curing on a pencil. You basically just use the white spirits to break up the pigment and put the pigment where you want it and to get this cool streaking done, which looks great, right? But now you need to varnish that because it's more like using a raw pigment, right? Like what we did on the tracks. There's no, there's no carrier holding this to the model right now. I could erase this off, right? Like I could a pigment. So now you'll want to varnish this. But I can take the varnish, right? The neatest thing about this whole deal... Let's take some of the ultra matte varnish. Put that where it doesn't fall over, hopefully. All right, and let's just now, I mean, we just did this, right? All right, bingo. Varnish over the top of it. Then use just a little bit of air. Now airbrush your varnish. If you brush your varnish on, you're probably going to move this stuff around. So again, the caveats are that you kind of need to do this the, the way I'm showing you. All right, I'm going to do a second coat real quick. All 
Okay. Air dry that one real quick. And in my opinion, one of the best and quickest ways to get very, very good streaking with pencils. Mix the colors, do whatever you want. You see our yellow and our gray and everything mix in, didn't overtake any of our camo, everything looks perfect on there. And that's awesome. And that's not going to go anywhere because we just put the varnish over the top of it, right? So you're left with a really, really dynamic looking piece that you can do that and nothing's going to crack like with oils. And, and it's a, it gives you kind of the best of both worlds but it's very specific. It's only gonna be for that dry streakiness that you want from rust, um, you know, dirt streak, rain streaking. It does all of that very, very good. It just isn't going to give you the wetness. It's not gonna give you pooled oil. It's not gonna give you gasoline spills as easily um, because it doesn't have a liquid component. It doesn't blur as easily as all those others do, okay? Yeah, I'm not seeing chat at all. So if you guys are talking, somebody let me know in chat. If you're trying to type and Twitch is being weird, I don't know. Or if everybody just fell asleep because you're bored with weathering. Yeah, I see Jen and Viking. All right, so good. Yay us. Yay us. And that's going to be locked on there. And then, of course, when you go through and do your lacquer varnish over it on the, the final coat. But now I can, I can handle this, right? And I can go and do the backside of it and do all of it together and then varnish all that and then hold it on the sides and do the top. And it's not going to rub all that pigment off of there because the varnish has locked it in now, right? Go fish. Yeah, we'll do some whip. We shall, we shall. We can do it right now. It is six o'clock. It's about whip time. Normally we go in about five. Exclamation point WIP in chat. If you want to show something off, feel free. Give you guys some time to uh, upload some stuff over to the gallery. It'll take you over to the Creature Caster community site and to our community gallery where you can upload pictures of what you've been working on. I want to see what you guys got going on. Viking T-Bear has got a couple over there. Tonk. <laughs> you got a wound counter. What? Cheater. Cheater. Did she take pity on you because you're having a kid? I don't even have a wound. I do have a wound counter, actually. Somewhere around here. <laughs> I was about to lie to you people. I have a wound counter, and I have a uh, objective point. Monument. But I don't know where they are. There's one. I really like the wound counter for the King of Ecstasy. And the Queen of Fate one is awesome, too. If you guys hadn't seen. I'll show it off, because you can't get any more, I don't think. Jen may tell me I'm a liar, but... The, uh, the Queen of Malefica is awesome. Our wound dials go 0 to 10, 0 to 20 in resin, and they come with two faces. So you've got the one that we put together for the Queen of Malefica with the the uh, the dead vulture head, and then you got the other one with the cyclopean center eye and the more feminine facial features. But they're awesome. I haven't cleaned this one up. It just came out of the package. They're uh, neat wound counters. Come with the magnets and the discs and all the good stuffs that you need. And somehow Viking Teabagger got one, that cheating cheater who cheats. Oh, it's because he's Canadian. <laughs> he's not Canadian. Are you Canadian? Are all you guys Canadian? What's up with all the Canadians? Oh, pal. Wrote a nice note. See, you guys are just buttering Jen up. I see what's going on in the background. Can't be trusted. 
can't be trusted. All right, let's take a look at what at Vikings work real quick. Uh, all right, so this one is a uh, nearly complete commission. Customer wanted Suicide Squad Harley Quinn theme. Tried your best. Need feedback for eye lenses, colors, or keep black with lens flare or OSL effect needed? Question mark. This is a cool model. And I definitely thought you nailed the Harley Quinn, right? Awesome job there. Hair looks really good. Um... I think like, yeah, I mean, I think like a glow on the the eye lenses would be really cool. The only other real, I mean, you don't have anything that it would intrude upon necessarily. Um, so definitely doable. As far as color goes, you've already got a good smattering of green in the kind of oil barrel behind her and the liquid in the uh, flasks on her side. So I might look at purple. Purple works pretty well. Yellow, probably too much with the hair. She got that pale blonde hair. So probably go with like a, like a purple glow or a, you know, a magenta, purpley red glow would work really well if you wanted to do that. Or just do them as black, shiny sunglass lenses, you know? Either or. I kind of think just the black sunglass style lens would work even a little better. Just because there's already a lot of color moving around on this thing, right? Because she's got the, the red, blue, half and half on the clothing and armor. Maybe just like sunglass lenses would be the best thing. Just a little bit of glare, right? Paint it like a gem, like a monochromatic gem. You're just going to use gray, a little bit of gray, and then on top of the gray, do white for that real high reflection. I think that would work well. Good looking model. Got a butt shot. Heine. Yeah, that's great. Speaking of dirty oil effects, that looks great. Yeah, good job. Very, very uh, timely seeing the, the oil here. Although your oil is going against gravity. <laughs> But don't let me knock you down a notch. Your oil stain is collecting in the in the anti gravity edge of this. It would be all down here. But I love it. Great job. Good looking model. What is this from? Is this just some post apocalyptic something or other? Or is it uh the wood grain on the bat? She does have a bat. I mean, is this intended to be like some sort of futuristic Harley Quinn? I almost feel like that's supposed to be a Harley Quinn, right? The wood grain on this is amazing, right? Great job here. Yeah, just a great model. Good job. Good job. Grim Skull Alternate Assassin. Oh, okay. Gotcha. They did a really good job. I mean, the pose and everything, right? Because there's a night model uh, Harley Quinn that was very similar to this that we did, right? Although I, I think she only had one hand holding the bat. But obviously not, not uh, um, the same exact pose, right? Because it was actually just Harley Quinn. Oh, for War Games exclusive. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I feel like this is a very Harley Quinn-esque model. Very cool. Great job. All right. Not a lot of whips. Oh, there's another one. DD character. Starting to understand fabrics from T. Schmidt. We have seen this model a lot. I really like this one. We've had a lot of people painting this one and asking about the OSL on her and all that stuff. I dig it. I like it a lot. Yeah, the key, you know, we always talk about the, uh, I guess the, I won't say the biggest key to painting fabrics, but one of the, the biggest keys um, is reflectivity, 
right? Shine, how bright do you go with your highlight? A lot of people take the highlight too high with fabrics. They paint it like they paint everything else. We typically paint a lot of armor, we paint a lot of guns, we paint a lot of hard surfaces, and hard surfaces tend to reflect more around the edges, so you get brighter color, you know, translates to an edge highlight. And you gotta be careful, right? Because with fabrics, if you go to that real bright edge highlight, it doesn't look like fabric anymore. Um, and so that's, that's usually the starting point that you work from. Then it gets into textures, right? It gets into a lot of times we've shown you how when you do want to brighten up an edge, rather than doing a line, do a, um, you know, like a hash, right? So like these lines in here, uh, I don't get a zoom on yours, so I can't tell. So I'm just going to talk in generalities. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm not saying that you didn't do this because I can't really see, but let's real quick take this and look at uh, our troll guy. I think he's probably one of the better examples we've got sitting around, right? At scale, right? So we've got like this guy and you want to make sure that, uh, you know, your fabric, you want, you do want to have highlights, right? I'm not saying that you don't want to highlight the edges of the folds and stuff, but you don't want to go super bright in comparison to your shadows because it starts looking too much like, you know, like metal where you go super bright around the edge and then you got a real dark shadow. You still want to go brighter, but you can help tone that down a lot by instead of just painting a line across by doing these texture marks, right? So none of that hashing is part of the texture of the model. That's all stuff that I've just done so that I could give it like a beat up hide kind of texture on him. But it acts twofold, right? By going in and putting all of these really small dots and lines along that fold, it also highlights the fold, right? Because it's a brighter color and gives texture at the same time and breaks it up and makes sure it doesn't get too bright. So by doing these kinds of things, you take care of a bunch of, of birds with one stone, but you also have to understand the fabric that you're trying to paint. Like on yours with her dress cloak, you know, uh, skirt, you probably don't want to do hash marks like this because it does make it look beat up, right? The, the lines tend to make fabric look beat up, like it's becoming threadbare, the threads are separating. Dots, on the other hand, if you go and stipple, um, can make things look like they just have a texture. Now, unfortunately, I think the only thing that I'm going to have that's a really good sample of that is also going to be like our leather here, right, on this guy, where instead of hash marks on everything, we use some dots on here too. And they do the same thing. They give you kind of that feel of, of highlighting, right, and then we use hash marks too, right. But same, same principle idea is that you can use that instead of doing lines. With fabric, I try not to do line highlights, right? So along an edge, don't do a line. Break it up, do dots. Just instead of taking your brush and, and moving it over the top, right, of the surface like this, like we normally would to get a highlight, right? Just break it up, just go, right? Not too much more time taken, but by doing it like this, you get a highlight still, but it also gives you a texture. There'll be light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. And then you can, you know, vary it by maybe you do one line of them and then you come back and add a couple more over here to make it more solid, but then it breaks up. And so you'll start feeling like there's a texture to fabric, which it has. Right. So just a good thing to remember as you're painting fabrics. Those are the, those are the biggest issues, not issues. Those are the biggest things to just kind of uh, continue to bring to the forefront in your brain as you're painting them so that your fabrics will be spot on every time. And then it just comes down to picking a color. Had to step away for dinner, so you're still going to do some OSL. Yeah, this lamp is great on her for being able to throw an OSL. It puts a bunch of light up against the wing and her arm and body over here. It's, it's also cool because unlike some miniatures, right, the OSL on her is, has got the ability to um, be on the off side. Right, because normally a miniature is looking this direction, swords pointing this direction, body is her body's kind of you know going away from the direction her sword is pointing, like she's flying up and away, like on guard, right? But the light gives you a really cool effect on the off side, right? So it allows you to put some really cool effect away from the attention. Like normally this model, all the attention would be over here, right? But now you get this cool secondary effect. So I would, I would. I would kind of suggest on a model like this because of that to keep it low on the brightness scale, like a dim glow, as opposed to, you know, booyah, all bright yellow over on the side away from the sword. But it's great. Good job. 
good job. Any quick tips for OSL? You do have an airbrush, but you're not sure it'll be much use with the position of the, of the lantern. Generally, at that point in time, using an airbrush is, is not your best solution. It doesn't mean you can't. I got an upside down picture. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't, right? Let's pull this back up. Um, but yeah, it, it, I guess it depends. If you have like our transparent paints work really good through the airbrush to give you that first burst of how the light would come out. But you're always trying to aim with the, the light itself being the center point of reference, right? So let's close this down again. Right, so if we've got uh, yada, 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 here's lamp girl or globe girl. So we got this girl, right? Our, our OSL test subject, right? And so what we do here is, you know, we take the airbrush and we would, you know, put the airbrush as if it were the globe. You got to be out here, right? But you're always aiming at the model as if you were the globe. So all of the light is going to hit from 360 degrees around this circle where we've got it lighting her up, right? And gets dimmer as we go away, right? And certain things are, the you know, light is blocked by her hand and her arm and the cloak. So there's not a lot of light up under her underarm and all that kind of jazz, right? So your lantern is down here. So you're just going to catch like this interior spot, right? Like imagine if this was her wing, she's holding the lantern here. It's going to get the, the wing. It's going to get the underside because it's low. So it's going to be the reverse. The top of her arm is not going to have any highlight and the bottom will and it's the side of her body. But I, uh, for something like that, I would typically go through and just do it with glazing, just a real thin pass of, uh, if you're doing like a, like a flame inside of that lamp and not electricity, you know, it's magic or it's, you know, it's an actual flame. Then I would probably start with like a, a maybe a burnt orange uh, glaze over it. So let's just take this model real quick. I've got, I've got burnt orange oils out here. I don't want to use those. Don't get carried away, Fuse. So I don't obviously have a lamp on her, but I'm just going to use the colors as if we did. Right, and I want some yellow ochre. So I'm taking some burnt orange, some yellow ochre, and some golden yellow. And on the lamp itself, you would probably push it to, you know, nearly white. Ivory, at least, right? But on the clothing, you won't, because most of it's hitting clothing, right? Yeah, most of it's hitting clothing and leather and wings, all, all non-reflective surfaces. So you got to be careful when doing this. You don't want to go too bright with your color for the OSL on the body. All right, so where's my number two brush go? There it is. If I just, uh, again, let's put the uh, palette cam back on real quick. All right, so here I've got burnt orange, uh, yellow ochre, and uh, bright yellow, golden yellow, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do, and I, granted, I don't have a, a good coating of paint here. You've got it going on greens and browns. So unfortunately, um, yeah, it would take me too long to paint all those colors in. So we're just going to do it over black, but I'm going to show you the general technique, right? So I take, and I would thin down my burnt orange. So again, take a, a lot of water on the brush, however much it'll hold, two times. Just touch it to the edge of the droplet there, pull that pigment down. So now you've got this very, very thin orange, right? So if I go over these greens, you see the kind of pigment density we've got? Virtually none. So it's dirty water glazing, okay? Pull it down. And then we're just going to glaze the whole area, painting back towards the lamp. So starting up on the areas you know it can hit, and then paint yourself back towards the lamp. So let's say it's going towards her hand in this case. So everything that the hand can hit, right? Don't go too far over the curvature of like a leg or anything. You might feather it a little bit, just so you don't have a, a complete line right there. You're not, paint pools up in those areas. Back after it with a second coat real quick. Oh, sorry.
got all ahead of myself, turned the palette cam back on, was painting like the palette cam went on anymore. It was very thin, letting it filter over the top of our base coats, in this case black. Right, that's looking pretty good right there. Always pulling your brush stroke towards the light source so that you're building up any uh, thicker amount or brighter amount of paint by virtue of that towards the source of the light. Okay, we want it to feather out towards the edge. So we're always painting back towards, in this case, like the hand. And we're just getting a dull glow right now, which is what we're going for, right? We don't want this first coat. We start with a darker color. We don't want it to stand out. You obviously don't want this to create like a, you know, a splotch of paint color on the model. Just barely there, right? So over our black, just barely there, barely glowing, right? But that handles the goal. And that's all achieved just because that paint is so thin, all right? Then we'll move to a little yellow ochre into that. Don't have to make this as thin, right? So we may want to have this be a little bit more potent. And again, same thing. We want to pull this back towards the light source, but now we're going to not, like I went out here to the edge of her breast, rib cage, top of the thigh. I want to pull in a little bit. So I'm going to go from just the side of all those areas. I'm not going to go down all the way to the calf. I'm going to stop at the knee, bring that paint up. But again, Bring it all back towards the source of the light, which is her hand. All right, so now we'll start seeing that brighten up a little bit. Again, just kind of right on the side of the breast here, side of the rib cage, top of the thigh of the knee, and then all of this on the cloak again, because it's close enough that the orange is not a huge concern. Right. Now it starts getting brighter towards the light source when you do that. Then we can just take some of the yellow ochre by itself. Again, super thin. Testing it over here. More potent than the last color. Still letting everything show through. My green still shows through, but I'm seeing more of that yellow ochre than I am the other two colors. And right now, I'm going pretty quick here. If you're doing this and you're doing it for maybe the first time at your end of the world, uh, let these dry. So you could hit it with a little air. Glazing is a thing that doesn't want to have too much paint overloaded. Sorry, talking with my brush in my mouth here. All right, you don't want to put too much paint and have it overload. Oh, I got varnish in the airbrush still real quick. Hang on, guys. I was like, wait a minute. There's liquid in here. Oh, it's turned to plastic. That's great. <laughs> Not quite. We got lucky. That's the kind of thing I would have left in overnight, though, and leaving varnish in the airbrush probably means buy a new airbrush. Uh, but letting the glaze dry between layers is your best bet. Uh, if you overload it, you get too much moisture going on uh, the surface of the model. The paint will break. It will loosen up all of the layers underneath it because it's all very thin, mostly water. And then you'll pull patches of paint loose and you'll see the color underneath in, in its entirety. And then you'll be kind of stuck, right? You have now got a patch on your model that you got to fix. And that's always a pain in the butt. So drying it between coats is pretty good. Good uh, way of doing things. So now we've got just the yellow ochre, still good. Right? And now... Remember, so we had the dark orange out here, the next color in here. Now with this color, I'm pulling it back even further. So I'm just bringing the yellow ochre in. Over all of that, get a little bit up here, side of the breast, little on the side of the hip where it has a dimension, and then just a little bit down the thigh, but nowhere near the knee and the other spot, right? And then this arm again. And you're just going to continue to do this until you're comfortable 
right, with the amount of brightness in towards the light source. Right? So if I continue to bring this in, I go to my bright yellow. And I've got my bright yellow will be the the least thin of all of my colors so far. I'm also not going to put it very far onto this stuff. I'm just going to pull it like right here towards the edges closest to, in this case, the hand, because we're pretending that we've got this lamp lantern thing. Right, so right here at the hand, a little bit up the arm, anywhere where we've got a fold that bulges out a little bit, some of these details. Along here, maybe a little bit on this fold down low. A little bit on the thigh. Yours is clothing, mine's skin, so the skin will have a little bit more of a reflection on it than like clothing would. Right. And that's about it. I mean, that's, you know, repeat as necessary until you get as bright as you want. This would be a very dim glow. I could keep coming in with a little bit more of the bright yellow. The more I brighten up down here, the overall brightness of the lamp increases considerably. The brighter I go, the further out this color would go. Right, until that first orange that we put on is barely a, a, a visible thing. It's just a warm glow in those areas like right here on the front of her stomach because really what we're seeing the most of is that brightest yellow. But it does, it does go out into those yellow ochres and those oranges and such and gives you that kind of warm glow feel. And then at the very end, if you wanted to, you could take um, like the... Uh, the golden yellow, I might add a little bit of ivory to it, but you could take the golden yellow by itself and you could just have it barely edge highlight things. She's got a bangly bracelet on like that, her thumb, maybe just the edge of the closest fold here. All right, maybe she's got like a belt have a little bit of brightness there. You pick up just a little bit of stuff like surface areas. So you've got like leather, maybe the edge of her leather belt on your model, something like that. But you've got these areas that now just have a little bit more reflectivity than the other areas, right? The strap that she's got going across her breast line, you know, maybe just a little bit on these folds. Right, but the further we get away, the less of that we would see. So we might have like just a hair down here, right? But you wouldn't have, you know, and then maybe right on the edge of her knee or something. And now you're starting to sell light. But you have to be very careful because what a lot of people will do is they'll get the glazing part down and then they'll over highlight all this with that last brightest color. It's keeping that to a minimum that helps the most, right? If you don't have burnt orange, then uh, if you've got our, our regular orange and uh, dark umber. I think Jen already said that. Yep. Yep. Orange and dark umber will, will get you really, really close, right? So let's do that real quick and test it. I want to say this right. I think Jen nailed it. It's either going to be mahogany or dark umber. You could use one or the other or both. Probably mahogany might even be the better idea there, right? Let's do it with mahogany first. I think, uh, well, we're just gonna try it. I think mahogany gets it a little too red. Right. So mahogany, orange, nope, that's it. Yep, mahogany and orange about 50-50, bingo. Boom, right? Maybe even a little bit more reddish in there. That would work fine. You know, it probably needs a little bit of burnt red as well.
oh, you know what, now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like what we wound up finding is it burnt red. Yeah, that's what it is. It's burnt red and orange. Burnt red and orange does it. That and that are damn near spot on the same, right? If I just take this, see, and get it to look at that. Yeah, burnt red, orange. Those are exactly the same. And the most reflective edges? Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Right, so here I just chose her hand. Imagine the lantern was like right in here. And you might bust it out further, make the light brighter. Just realize that the further you push out the brightness, the further you need to push out the dark light too. Dark light, weird word, right? But that darker color that you used would go further. So like if we wanted to make the, the brightness go further, I would probably need to come in here and... Uh, Take the burnt orange, right? And I'd probably, if this was going to get any brighter, then I'd have to extend this out to like her cheeks and the part of her face that the light could hit past her shoulder here, right? Because the from where the lantern would be, you can still see her cheek and stuff over here. So I'd have to get some of this color here if I went brighter. And a lot of times you got to get the worm's eye view, right? You got to think of yourself as the light source. So I'd have to look at the model from where the lantern was and see that it's glowing back correctly on everything, right? So if I brighten it up, maybe I get her cheek over here a little bit, right? Maybe that glow comes a little bit over the top of the breast, a little bit up onto the shoulder, a little bit brighter across all these areas. in order for me to then use the uh, the yellow to make it overall brightness go up. I have to drag the yellow ochre out a little bit further match but you can adjust this you can see how you can go through and you know make this brighter and brighter as you need And then if I bring the yellow out further, as I'm brightening this whole thing up, now if I increase that brightness, then I've got to have, you know, this color goes a little bit further. Now, it can only hit what it can hit. So you can't, you don't just keep bringing the color over across the top of the breast because the light's down here. It wouldn't shine up there. So you just want to extend those colors further to the areas you can get. The glow will go around the curve just a little bit. So you extend it a little bit, but you're not going to pull paint all the way over here if the lantern's back here because it's going to be shaded. There's a hard line where light can't go past at some point, right? But then if you pull your yellow that way, further. Um, I almost reached over and grabbed some of the uh, the oil paints that are on. This is going to be, yeah, it's going to be scary. I'm going to have to throw this piece of palette paper away. Otherwise, I'm going to be painting with oils unnecessarily. I'm like, oh, there's white right there. It'll be great. Nope. That. We're going to have to make a brighter yellow for the highlights in close, right? So I've mixed a little bit of ivory. And then I come back where I had that just that bright yellow before, and now I'll use the ivory and yellow mix to do what I had done before, right? To get just those highlights 
in those specific areas brought up a little bit more because I, in, I increase the intensity, right? So I got to do it to everything, including the highlights. So something like that. Just as a quickie. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have any color underneath this, so it's going to look different when you do it because you're going to be putting yellow and orange light over green. Just don't freak out. You'll get some crazy colors. It'll get some bright browns and things like that out of it, which is exactly what happens. Um, you know, but this should hope, you know, hopefully helps you with, you know, the general nature of what you're trying to create. All right. Upside down. Nolzer's young green dragon. I dig it. <laughs> I dig it. He's hanging from the ceiling. These are actually really fun miniatures. I've noticed a bunch of people on Facebook, uh, you know, posting up the young dragons that came from the D&D &D set. This one, right? The Wizards of the Coast. Yeah, that does it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, they're great models. Good start on this guy. You know, it's weird, right, how the brain doesn't interpret things correctly. Like, I can sit here and I can say, oh, yeah, everything looks good. I really like the brown on the base that you got going on. But it's weird how my brain can't wrap around this correctly because I know it's upside down. So my I can't talk to shadows and all of that coloring, right, just because the orientation is incorrect for how you're painting it. So I don't want to give you any pointers on that. Uh, Viking Teabagger, uh, not sure if I showed completed Chaos Sorcerer a while ago. Need closer picture. <laughs> Synthetic is like stupid iPhone, right? Like, uh, like it's weird. Like if you take the, if you just hold your phone upside down, the whole picture is upside down. Like, shouldn't you know, like what's going on? I think I remember when you were doing the armor on this guy. Do we have a closer look? I like the deep red on the cape for sure. The tarnished yellow metallic on here is really cool, too. I can dig it. Again, I want to tell you to push further into your shadows. It, you may be getting oversaturation on the light because of your camera and your, and your room. I feel like I want to see more, more shadows in all of this. Like the underside of the arm and around all these cylinders. I dig it, though. I like that color. That bluish purple is cool. More T. Schmidt. More D&D &D dudes. Ooh, I like this guy. I like this armor. Nice job with the blue. Your grays and blacks are spot on. This black cloak is perfect, right? Here's a great job of exactly what we were talking about, right? Using that texture in the sculpt. Like, it looks like this, te this sculpt actually has the fabric sculpted into it a little bit. Um, and you pulling it off with that more hatching feel. Don't be afraid to let the hatching give you your highlight first and then just do more hatches to tie it together so you don't get just a big solid line of gray. But this is great, right? This black looks really, really good. I like it. Nice job. Black's really hard to pull off. Good job on that one. Synthetic gate. I want to love your picture. I want to. I really just love the model, man. It's a very dynamic model. I love the fact that it's flying and on a flight stand. How big is this? Like, I can't get a feel. I guess I can. They're not really big. Huh. Yeah, they're not huge, are they? I mean, he's got a big old wingspan, so. Uh, Remy's, uh, what to do with that big block of the sculpt between the ribbon belt and the robes? Derry, what's going on? Six inches across. That's actually not bad. That's so very manageable. Yeah, so you're seeing here the problem with plastic extrusion, right, when they mold, is that there's no undercut there uh, because it wouldn't pull out of the mold easy. So this a lot of GW figures. A lot of plastics have this, right? Some resins and stuff, but mostly, mostly plastics because um, the sculpt just doesn't have anything there. I typically go in on this. 
right? Because, yeah, because this, when you look at the back, you're actually facing it. So number one, you're going to have to give some fake depth to this ribbon, right, that's hanging. You're going to have to paint in a little bit with the, the ribbon red, not all the way up to the cloth, though. What I would do is do a pin wash of maybe a black-brown pin wash in here, uh, just between that area to give you a false shadow. Obviously, it's from the top. Your light would hit it. You wouldn't have a lot of shadow here, but you're going to need it just to break the red apart from the clothing. So it's an unfortunate you know, series of events that leads to these kinds of things. But you want to darken up this line right around the cloth here and then paint your red to give it some thickness, right? The eye is not really going to see it as a problem as long as that darkness is there. It'll make it feel like there's a fake shadow because the ribbon falls away from the cloth that isn't actually sculpted there. That's your, that's your best bet. Your Halloween costume that you need for Saturday. Wait a minute. It's Thursday. <laughs> now you're on a dead run. I love it. I really love the uh, blend that you got going on from like the, the blue, jade, and green. This is very similar uh, to what we're doing on the, the King of Ecstasy. I love this. Great coloring. You're, you're talking to my heart with these colors. Is that it? Is that it? Do refresh. Where you got the color? Awesome. I'm glad it's working for you. Those are great. All right. Skirt. What is this? More again. T. Schmidt. Butt shot. Yeah, I'm really digging these guys. Good work. Uh, working on Armin and did some uh, glaze blending on his robes to try and make it look like fabric. Thoughts on how it came out from Boneyard. See if we can zoom in a bit. I'm really digging it. I like this kind of color shifted change, right? I'm really, we've been playing around with a lot of that, but I love the purple and then into this kind of turquoisey jade color on top. I, I'm liking this a lot. Looks really good. Take it easy, Viking. Thanks for hanging. Yeah, I really dig this. Professional procrastinator. <laughs> sure. Yeah, take pride in all your actions. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, T. Schmidt, those bone sculpts are not the best at all. At all. Yeah, I want to see it, Derry. Are you like, is it like a, a home-built costume, I'm assuming? I love it. Jen and I don't do a lot on Halloween, but I like looking at all the pictures of those who do. Any CC on the color choices? I like your color choices overall. I like the red then with the purple and the turquoisey robe down below. It works really well. It brings some heat into the whole thing. Um, I think what you do with the, the bone and the gold trim on this model is where a lot of it either either succeeds or I don't want to say fail because it's not like pass fail, right? But this model has a lot of the bone on the horns and then the trim that if you go with like gold and then you do the bone with bone color, make sure that you push your gold into either kind of a false orange or yellowish, like almost fake gold feeling uh, so that it pulls it away in contrast and, and hue from the bone that you do. Uh, you haven't done all that yet, but I can see like from the horns that it looks like you're going with more of a bone color up in these. So just be careful as you do that, right, to make your, your trim and the gold on his armor and all and the gold that's going to be on the flying disc maybe. I'll pull all that away so that those two don't. That's the one thing I've seen with this model just in general with lots of people doing it is that they get lost in that bone to metal color, right? So even if you do the textures correct, this model's just got a lot going on. And because of the shapes of everything, with those colors nestled in close together, it can just kind of make it tough to view what's going on. I dig what you got going on here. This is really nice. Ooh, I like this purple. I like this a lot. I like the textures that they have on these, right? The inside of her skirt being kind of like padded armor is really neat. Home stitched from scratch. Make me a blanket. <laughs> I mean, sure. Make me a blanket with a mural of the Sistine Chapel on it. I feel like I need that. <laughs> Don't really make me a blanket. I'm still at the point where I'm not, I'm not quite ready to deal with the fact that I, I, I think I need a blanket when I sleep at night. Like, I still don't feel like that's quite right. 
I like this a lot. T. Schmidt, great job with the purple. Looking really good. Great job on the hair, too. I like the kind of, uh, like, fiery blonde that you got. A little bit of warmth with the orange in there. Skin, everything looks really good on these models. You know, and no, because the Bones model that we just did that really quick OSL on, same kind of thing. These models are not the greatest detail-wise, but you've really pulled it together. I like this a lot. Again, great job on the fabrics. All righty. I like it. So quick recap on everything we've done tonight. I feel like we've hit a lot of points. We've discussed quite a bit, and it was probably a brain explosion to some extent. But uh, when dealing with weathering and all the things that we've done, there are so many options and opportunities of how to do stuff and what to do. And, um, you know, so I wanted to start hitting on some of those so that you could kind of see, right, the differences in techniques and things that various products will bring to the table. We did uh, the, uh, the streaking with oil paints right on this one and with acrylics on this one and this one. Right? So you can see how virtually no difference overall in the grand scheme of things on how they look, just a difference in their application and the need for paying a lot of attention as you go through and do the acrylics for placement, transparency, all of that is locked in as you do it. So you've got to pre-prep your acrylic paints to thin them down on the palette to the right level so that they won't overdo it here because you're not going to thin them out once they're on the model. So it's just a little bit more pre-planning and a little bit more specificity on the placement of acrylics because they don't move around. You don't have that, that playful nature of oils that let you, you know, kind of um, uh, reopen them, move them, erase them, come back and edit what you've done. The oils, on the other hand, uh, give a, a great effect, happens really quick, but if I rub my finger across that right now, it will go away, okay? And I can't varnish it until tomorrow-ish, right? Because I want to make sure that it's all off-gassed and that it's not going to be loose on there. So all of these areas where we've done like this, you know, this heavy streaking and especially this big oil stain off the axle in the back, all done with oils, looks fantastic, worked like a champ, went on really easy. I mean, we basically just stippled this on in five seconds, maybe? 10 seconds? I don't know. Almost instantaneously. No no uh, real um, like training needed other than how to stipple your brush and how to use the white spirits to blur it. And once you've done it once, you'll get it a million times. Um, but again, this will wipe right off of here if I hit it with my finger. So I got to wait 24 hours or so before 18 hours, something like that, before I go back and hit it with any varnish. All right. Um, all of the scratches and stuff we did with just the... Uh, Pulled out pluck foam from our hobby go bag. So we just took a rectangle of pluck foam, cut it up to give it not a point, but you know, a, more of a point on there. And then just nah, 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 rotating it around. Uh, used black brown paint on this as we went. Right? And got really, really good kind of overall scratches, dings, and all of that on the armor. Right? Um, after we did that with the black brown, uh, we went back, we cut a stipple brush. A long time ago and then we just used that stippling brush which i don't know where it is now i've put 50 million things on the table today stippling brush so this is just a number two round number four number four round uh that had seen better days this is one of the old original slow fuse gaming utility brushes and so we just cut it off right so it's now down to a pretty uh short sturdy bristly brush uh and then we just thin down um some of our uh, burnt orange and we took that and stippled it over the top of all of the scratch areas that we did to give kind of that weird kind of warm halo grimy coloring that shows up in amongst the green like you can see it up here really well right back in around here so just very thin to kind of give a dirty look to all the areas that are beat up uh after that we went in and uh did the uh the burnt orange, uh, burnt red, and uh, yellow ochre, stippled it into the cracks or into the areas where we've got the chipping, right? So we just went in and stippled with a, a fine brush. So I was using a number two, I say fine brush. We're using a number two artillery brush. 
that hopefully doesn't have white spirits on it now because I just licked it. Ah, my tongue's on fire. Um, so we used this and we just took very, very thin versions of that and dotted in all of these, you know, areas where we've got dots of red and orange and yellow ochre for that kind of rusty feel, right? So we just kind of dotted that in using our finger to blur it as we did it, right? After we got done with that, we grabbed a small number zero and went in and with our bright yellow green, just stippled that in along these edges, right? Not drawing lines to highlight the bottom of these things, just going in and just tapping the brush very lightly along these surfaces to give these highlighted spots underneath all the chips, okay? Notice we didn't do all of them. We just picked some so that you get that texture in there. You don't want to overdo it. It starts looking too comical if you do every single chip. Plus, I mean, we've done a bajillion chips, so you'd, you'd take a year to do this, right? So just go in and highlight a little bit, gives it a little bit more texture, amps it up a little bit, right? Makes it a little bit more fun. Okay. Once we did that, then we went in with the oils and we did the streaking and showed the difference between that and using the transparent acrylics to do the streaking and then the oils to do the oil stain on the back of the axle. Right. Then we kind of broke out and said, hey, just to flip it all on its head, let's do something really fun and let's do some streaking on the turret here and we use colored pencils. So we use colored pencils and white spirits on here. I basically just grabbed some of these uh, waxy colored pencils. They're not chalk. Uh, you know, they, you can tell because if you were to put this on sandpaper and run around, it gets really gummed up. Uh, it doesn't create dust. Um, and these are Spectracolor design pencils. And they seem to work really well. Um, and you just draw lines and we did a bunch of colors and then you take the white spirits and blur it out. Uh, then we varnished over it immediately. Uh, unlike the oils, these don't take a long time to cure. There's nothing that keeps you from being able to go in here, draw the lines on, blur it with the white spirit so that it looks just like the oil, uh, and then varnish over the top so that it doesn't wipe off when you hit it with your finger. All right. So these are good and secure and will be on there. And I'll probably wind up doing all of my tanks with the pencils. Um, over the course of doing this, I've got to go back and do like the truck and things like that. But there'll be a mix of all of these things that really get you to the finish line. Uh, anytime that you're doing like vehicle weathering, even weathering on just a space Marine doing shoulder pads and things like that, you can take, um, you know, the, uh, the sponge deal and you can stipple on, like we've done this blue ish shoulder pad here. We can take like a, a gray, let's just take like a, a lighter gray. Uh, probably a real light gray. Take like light neutral gray, right? Right, and I can get rid of most of that. And I can do the same thing that I did on the tanks, but I can sit here and Do chipping on Space Marine shoulders. Same exact way. So it's not just for vehicles. All of these things can be used for really cool effects on lots of your models. Right? And it's up to you how you want to use them. But you can create, you know, battle damage on Space Marines. Do whatever you want. Right? So it doesn't matter what you're painting. All of these things can be used in, in various levels, mixes. You'll use oils. If you like oils, you can use acrylics. With the oils, you just have to be careful, like we talked about, that the oils fully cure before you go trying to put acrylics over the top of them. Otherwise, you get that off-gassing and cracking and bubbling of paint. And uh, it's not as bad as I'm making it sound, but it can ruin a good paint job. Uh, really quick if you're not careful. So you just have to get used to the timing and application of these various mediums that we're talking about. Uh, whereas the pencils are immediate. We, we drew them on there, we blurred them out, then we varnished over the top of it without even taking a breath. Uh, those work great in tandem with the acrylics. We can go right back over the top of that with acrylics now that it's been varnished. So those two work very well hand in hand. Um, and there you go. So yay us. I feel like we did it, right? I feel like we did it. T. Schmidt put another picture up. We'll look at it and then we're out of here. I'm hungry. I got leftover spaghetti, the, the spaghetti, right? I feel like now we got T. Schmidt's got an upside down one. Yours is upside down too. <laughs> T. Schmidt, upside down succubus. He's hanging from the ceiling. 
I want to, I really want to like this, this skin tone with the purples and the reds. That looks great. Right. Again, it fools with my head because it's upside down. Jerry, almost done. Needs some top stitching and it's ready to find a new home. This one's awesome. I'm assuming this is Jerry. This is awesome. Oh, it's a peacock. It looked like a tentacle for a second, right? Like I was looking at it and I was like, ooh, it's an octopus. Oh no, it's a, it's a peacock feathers. But I was just looking down here. This is awesome. This is incredible. I really dig this. I hope Jen is still looking at this. This is awesome. Very good job. Very good. And this is your costume. Test of pattern pieces for the costume. Starting the cutout of the good stuff tonight. Tomorrow we assemble. I don't even want to ask what it is. I want to, I want to see once it's done. You, you have to promise to come back and show us. So you've made this whole thing. So this is just your, your pinning pieces of the pattern together, all Hollywood fashionista style. I'm interested. I want to know what this is. I dig it. I dig it. Oh, you've stitched it together already? So then are you going to, you got to put stuff on top of this, I assume? This is like the base layer? I'm not even going to ask. You don't have to give away any details. I want to see it when it's done. Cheap, unbleached cotton. Yeah, I'm excited to see what you're doing. That'll be a lot of fun. All right, gang. So that's it for me. I feel like we've done our work. We've done the good work here today. We've taught you some cool stuff. Hopefully, you'll take these tools and go make some really cool artwork that we can view later on. Um, yeah. Fun. Showed you very inexpensive oil paints from your local hobby store. We spent $7.99 on 12 different colors. You do amazing stuff with it. Buy yourself some white spirits. Don't buy the Winsor Newton white spirits. They're like way too much. Seven bucks for a bottle. And you can just go to the hardware store and buy white spirits for, <laughs> I don't know, five bucks a gallon or something like that. Four ninety nine dollars a gallon. You'd have more than you could, you could use it with you and all your family members in your whole neighborhood. If you, if you just go to the hardware store and buy it. Um, but yeah, easy stuffs. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for watching uh, Paint Dry with me for today. We'll be back tomorrow with Jen, uh, following Kenny over at Next Level Painting uh, at 5 p.m. Pacific. So have a wonderful rest of your evening. If we don't get a chance to catch you tomorrow, have a great weekend, and we'll catch you on the flip side next Tuesday. Adios, gang. Have a wonderful day. We'll see ya.